Dr. Ru, good morning. Uh, good evening here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nice. Good, good, good to see you, sir. Good to see you. You as well. Ah. Yeah. yeah, so we, we are good to go. Everything is all right. Your voice is very clear. Video is good. So, Excellent. Yeah. So the uh, all set and uh, in about eight to ten minutes, we will go live. Okay, perfect. Let's check yeah, the it's, PowerPoint. It's perfect. it's perfect, Dr. Ru. It's perfect. It looks... Yeah. Do and that Ru. works fine. You see it. everything's... Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely... Perfect. You can, you, you can stop the screen show for the moment because uh, the Honorable Chairperson okay. will be introducing the speakers. Then we will go with the flow and it will be live on YouTube also on our channel. Brilliant. Is there a link, so, is there a link for that somewhere for the YouTube link I'll, I'll 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 send you the link i'll send you the link i'll mail you the link okay okay thank you so much yeah even on the top top of the screen there there is a youtube live copy streaming link on left left of oh, your oh i see it you can copy Perfect. the link okay ji good to see you and okay. we'll start in a moment perfect Good morning, Dr. Sashi Rekha, Dr. Malar. Good morning, Professor. Yeah, Dr. Malar, can, can you increase the brightness uh, because your, your face is not visible? If you slightly tilt yourself, that will make it better because it's- Now it's, is it fine? Uh, you, have to, you have to just adjust- Is it fine brightness. now? A uh, little bit improved. Okay, yeah, this is perfect. Now it's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, so, now here network issues going on, uh, sir. That is the issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can understand. Hope so, everything is hearty. Congratulations. Start, uh, yeah, we will start in five to ten minutes once Dr. Deshmukh is there and uh, others they join in, in the meeting. Okay, ji. Hello, Professor Ru, and uh, hello, Dr. Shashi Rekha. Uh, good morning, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so how are you doing? Very well. We're, we're uh, finishing our time here in Ecuador, so getting ready to head home tomorrow, actually. Okay. So. It is going to be a fresh finish and it is going to be a fresh start for us. Yeah, we hope so. It should be good. It's been a very productive trip, so. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's, it's great. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ru, just to share with you, uh, we at Patiala, uh, we had an expert uh, on the pyrenomycetes fungi, Dr. J.S. Dargan. He retired oh. in 2006 and he published a very good number of uh, paper on pyrenomycetes, the then pyrenomycetes, xyleria, nectrias, hypoxylons, yeah. So, no, I, and I, I, he, 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 he was my PhD co-supervisor when I joined my research. Uh, that's brilliant. No, I've read, I've read his papers. They're wonderful. Yeah, yeah. He, ah. he's, he's, he's currently in UK with his son and uh, he, he has immense contribution towards uh, this Eskomycetes. <clears throat> ah, I know. It's, yeah. yeah, no, he's an inspiration for sure. Yeah, and it's really great you spared your time and uh, that added to the diversity of lectures and uh, 
<laughs> it really gave a very good uh, exposure to the people who are working on this group from this part of the world yeah i hope i hope people enjoy it it's yeah absolutely the... absolutely people are waiting eagerly for this lecture <laughs> ah, good morning please. everybody morning sir good morning good morning dr ru how are you i'm fine i'm anasatri i'm from this very department where the conference is being organized i work on mushrooms ah i heard nice about you, you from uh, dr deshmukh ah yeah sk nice. deshmukh he is very close friend of mine oh brilliant yeah excellent no it's 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 been it's been great this is i i have always i don't know i've always wanted to one of these days i i would love to come and work in india uh, so so much habitat diversity it's incredible yeah one of our teacher he worked on xylariales for a very he was he is the only person professor js darga yeah has some really excellent papers but there's definitely still more work to be done yeah 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 definitely he was a student of professor ks thin mm -hmm. who is uh, one of the pioneer ecologists of india from punjab mm -hmm. yeah So very good morning to everyone. The site is Dr. Manruti from good Punjab morning. University, Patiala. Good morning, madam. I am morning. Professor Raman from uh, Chennai. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, we are ready. Yes, are ready, sir. Ready, sir. the organizers and uh, the msi secretary on behalf of uh, msi the secretary is ready all ready sir all ready oh yes good good man on excellent very chairman chairperson dr deshmukh yeah deshmukh welcome deshmukh dr deshmukh welcome he is not there as yet i can't see him sir, he haven't joined yet sir Yeah, he has. You are the coach, your person, Malarudi. Okay, good. I'll give a, I'll give them a call, sir. Yeah. Gugani is not uh, presenting, uh, Malarudi, Doctor Malarudi. So. uh the uh, lecture 4 is the uh, is uh, is not uh, is uh, not presenting okay Harry, sir uh, sir good morning sir madhivanan ah uh, good morning uh, professor madhivanan uh, morning. very good morning sir very good morning good morning good morning, good morning, morning sir good morning, uh, good morning sir morning very good morning sir busy schedule we are uh, participating the conference thank you very much ah uh, thank you sir thank you sir Okay. Good morning, Professor Kaur. Ah, good morning, morning, sir. Morning, sir. Morning, good morning, Professor. Good, good morning, good morning, good morning, sir. 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 Yeah. Good morning, Doctor Du. Shashi Rekha here. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, sir. Yes. Raman sir. <laughs> Raman sir. Good morning. Yeah. Raman sir. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Morning. Good morning, yeah. ma'am. Yeah. Good morning, Malar. Good morning, ma'am. Yeah, I just saw you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good morning, Malar. 
Good morning, sir. Sir, congratulations. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, congratulations, and, uh, sir. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, it's all your, uh, you know, good wishes and support. And I am product of uh, Madras University. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great yeah. honor. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Dr. Bhat sir. Um, uh, really, we are very happy from CS in Botany. Oh. Our alumnus has awarded a lifetime achievement award. Oh, it's a, it's an honor to you know all of us. And I I will never forget. I made a special reference of uh, what was uh, Chennai, you know, and my stay there. It's okay. really remarkable, mm -hmm. not only for just for mycology, for for everything, you know, such a cultural diversity. I was there, and amazing place. And Raman was my almost every day. Mate, there. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be together always. Yes. Yeah. On the evening, we are going to the uh, Udaya, uh, Udaya and Yuvasal and uh, we, Muttuveri, we used Correct, to... Correct, correct. Uh, amazing time. <laughs> sir, Raman, sir. Yeah, in uh, uh, the inaugural session, uh, YouTube will record all, yeah? No, sir. The organizers will not tell you, sir. That's yeah. right. Uh, we'll ask them later, yeah. Sir, it was recorded, sir. Huh. Sir, Raman, sir, huh. it is recorded. I have seen the recording while the uh, inaugural function was there. On. No, no, it was recorded, but it is not there in the YouTube. Uh, Only they will uh, delicate later, sir, probably. Okay, okay. Uh, good, good morning, Bhat, sir. Oh, good morning, sir. Good morning very much. Uh, <laughs> We we have the H, HD uh, recordings available. It's It's available on YouTube and it can be downloaded. So yeah. our, our technical expert is there. He said that it will be available uh, today afternoon. So you okay, okay. And you can share it with your uh, colleagues and uh, family. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, you. Good morning, uh, Dr. Avinash. This is Madhivanan from Chennai. Morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you, sir? Yeah, fine, Avinash. fine. We are, we are waiting for Dr. Deshmukh. Once he yeah. joins, we are set to go. I mean, it, yesterday's program was excellent and uh, it was so well organized and, uh, uh, you know, Easy. wonderfully you did that job. Uh, the key, key to this is the active participation and the quality yes. lectures yeah. that have been delivered and uh, that has been the, the source and uh, okay, most important factor. The entire team was devoted, sir. Everybody was contributing at his own heart place. Yeah, and that made it possible, sir. It, it was so good, yes. And uh, everything was crystal clear, the presentations, yes. Great job. Uh, everything is uh, transparent also, sir. Yes, 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 correct. And uh, the... For lifetime achievement, we are following the uh, rules that uh, the membership list we are following, sir. Yeah, yeah. Raman, uh, Professor Raman, I look forward to the 50th year celebration in a grand way in Chennai and really... Support to you. Of course, yes. We will be there for everything, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's why... Because we must make it most memorable, yes. We plan for the uh, compilation of... Uh, uh, the mycologist of India, uh, past and present. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, another uh, thing, you know, uh, uh, Ram sir, I suggest uh, you initiate some uh, monthly one or two webinars from MSI in general. You see, presently it is being done from Mumbai uh, unit. But I, you also organize because this is a very good thing. And this forum you should use not only for just lectures, but also some kind of uh, training programs. Workload is heavy, sir. No, uh, nobody knows how much the secretary is working, how much the editor no, no, is no. working. How much, how Assigned much. to Malar this job. She can organize this. As a MSI, unless otherwise some uh, this thing, uh, some, uh, uh, say, uh, some institutes are willing to come forward, uh, it is not possible for MSI exclusively organizing. Uh, uh, no, no. Presently, Mumbai Unit is organizing, and Professor yeah. Dr. Deshmukh it is doing. He is doing so well. Dash, Deshmukh yeah. and Shashireka they are doing that, and uh, it will be nice to have it uh, in general. And we, yeah. not only just lectures, 
but also sir, some it's not possible sir i can say it is uh, the msi is doing his uh, job excellently uh, and uh, for the, how much preparation for the annual meeting from the starting the avanit paul and myself so many i know i know people. yeah yeah so it will be a longer time sir it will take some time some institute can yes, yes, sir some institute can come forward for organizing a webinar in btv and uh, organizing workshop uh, so that the msi can uh, correct correct ask mallar to do in from cas because cas should do this job yeah 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 is always always uh, open but the other is mallar sir sir secretary sir atri sir sir Secretary, sir. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Sir, Madhivanan. Sir, yes. Webinar we can do, sir. That's not a problem. Yeah, we will. We will initiate, sir. Initiation should come for. It is not the MSA directly. Don't want to yeah. uh, put more energy on. We will take it up, sir. This webinar. Yeah, uh, yeah. Please, Madhivanan, you do this exercise. We will help you. Yes. Yes, sir. So, yeah, we will do it. Sir. So, okay. Uh, I think. Doctor yeah. Deshmukh is uh, has not joined till now. Okay, so now we can do. I what we can do? 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 is not picking up let's wait for him he may join if he doesn't join then we can sir the speakers are from international okay. sir sir he is he is with us he is with us oh. dr ru dr ru is with us so we is yep. with you wait here. okay yes sir no kar lijiye kar lijiye okay he is joining so dr dr, dr. dr. deshmukh is joining he is joining good good, good. Excellent. He was of the impression that it is at nine thirty. Doctor Bhat, thanks for uh, telling about Mumbai Unit. And uh, we are not different from MSI uh, National. We are not at all different. So it's uh, already doing a good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. You are doing Fantastic. really well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I just asked him whether, yeah. uh, but he, I understand his difficulties. Yes. Yeah. And you please continue this and. Uh, yeah, I will. I will. I, I will do it. I am doing it for the subject, sir. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you. And you do this. Incorporated yeah. all details about all the webinars which were conducted by MSI Bombay yeah. Unit in Kolkata yeah, yeah. in Volume. Yeah, yeah. Sir, yeah. Sir, 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 and uh, we also sir, have... uh, sir has joined the honorable the honorable president mycological society of india professor rupam kapoor is with us the honorable secretary is with us so we welcome yes. all the all the uh, uh, dignitaries all the office bearers of msi to this session and uh, may i request may i request uh, uh, Professor D P Singh from Department of Botany, Punjabi University, Patiala, who is a man from the field of algal physiology, primarily working focusing on the pesticide degradation by using cyanobacterial strains. He is an excellent physiologist, contributed immensely to this field. So he will be moderating this session. Over to you, Professor Devendra Pal Singh. Thank you. Dr. Abhinit Pal ji, uh, for saying few words uh, for my appreciations. Good morning to all. First of all, I thank I thank Dr. Abhinit Pal Singh, organizing secretary of this conference, and Professor Manruchi Kaur, uh, convener of this uh, conference, for giving me opportunity to introduce the chairperson and co-chairperson of this session. So I. i welcome sir for uh, giving me this chance to uh, introduce these uh, 
Dr. Sunil Kumar Deshmukh received his PhD degree in mycology from Dr. H. S. Gaur University Sagar, India in 1983. A Dr. Deshmukh, a veteran industrialist microbiology, spending a substantial part of his career in Hawkest Marion Russell Limited, presently this is known as Snowfi India Limited, Mumbai, and also Piramil Enterprise Limited, Mumbai, where he worked in the field of drug discovery. Dr. Deshmukh is a leading person responsible for establishing the microbial culture collection in Hawkest Marion Russell, India Limited, Mumbai, and Pyramid Enterprise Limited, Mumbai. He is an eminent microbiologist with more than 34 years of industrial experience in the area of bioprospecting, especially towards the development of anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetic, anti-infective, agrochemical, nutraceuticals, and prebiotics from various microbial sources. He is a past president, Mycological Society of India. Currently, he is a fellow and area convener, Terry Deccaneno Biotechnology Center. He has published more than 100 research papers and review articles, as well as many book chapters in reputed uh, journals and uh, agencies, uh, various agencies where he published eight books. So presently, uh, Dr. Deshmukh is president of My College Society of India, Mumbai, and advisor to various biotechnological industries. So currently, he is involved in development of natural colors, antioxidant, and biostimulus using nanobiotechnology. I welcome you, sir, for sparing time for us to chair this session. Now I will. Uh, would like to introduce the co-chairperson, Dr. K. Muller Vizai, assistant professor working in Center for Advanced Studies in Botany, University of Madras, Chennai. So, uh, Dr. K. Muller Vizai, he is uh, working in the field of molecular taxonomy, fungal pigments, and he is also working in on uh, the study of various volatile compounds occurring in various <laughs> sources of the fungi. And he's also specialized in the field of nanobiotechnology. Dr. Muller Vizai published more good number of research paper in international journals of repute. And he's also have one project to his credit currently uh, this. So I also welcome K. Muller Vizai to uh, uh, to act as a co-chairman of this session. So once again, I uh, once again I uh, welcome both chairperson as well as uh, uh, co-chairperson and request to uh, proceed for uh, the proceeding of these sessions. Kindly, uh, Professor Deshmukhji and. Dr. K. Malar Vijay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Deshmukh, yeah. uh, welcome to uh, this meeting. And uh, oh, I, I, I request uh, uh, Dr. Deshmukh to start the proceeding, please, of this session. Okay. Good morning, uh, everybody. Dr. Deshmukh, one minute. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Arish uh, Gugani, he, to, uh, he told that he is, uh, he is not well and uh, he is not presenting the paper. Okay. Lead lecture. That is uh, lead lecture four, he is not going to present. Okay. So uh, kindly stick on uh, to 30 minutes, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you, please. Yeah. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to second day of this MSI meeting. Uh, first speaker is Dr. Ru. He is a adjunct faculty, Institute of Ecology and Evolution, University of Oregon. He obtained his PhD degree in the ecology, ecological role of fungal endophytes, completed undergraduate work at Virginia Tech, PhD from Oregon Inst University, 
He received the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program in 2011 and the MSA Graduate Fellowship in 2013. The Roos research work, research is varied, but is tied together by endophyte, the fungi that lives asymptically in the endophytes, basically. He was awarded the best graduate student oral presentation for his talk on the Epiclo invasion ecology work and the paper resulting from the project was recently accepted for publication in biological invasion. What I know that this paper is already published. His work includes the xylaria of the cloud forest of Eukader. His interest is taxonomy of neotropical stomatic escomai seeds and wood rot fungi, as well as the ecology of symbiotic, particularly endophytism. He published around 25 papers. I request him to make his presentation. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, uh, Dr. Deshmukh. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you everybody for having me. Um, let me find my presentation for the screen share. Um, this works, you can see. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so today I, I would like to present um, a, a little bit of a study we did on what we call the foraging ascomycete hypothesis. Uh, this is a hypothesis that explains some of the spatial ecology for fungal endophytes. Um, this is a paper we published a couple of years ago and we've continued to work on this hypothesis. So I'll tell you a little bit about some of that work. Um, so first, um, I work on uh, Xylariales, uh, these stromatic ascomycetes. Um, the most common, I think, that people, at least in North America, where I'm from, are familiar with is Xylaria hypoxylon, which also occurs in India, very common. Um, little black fingers, you see them everywhere. Uh, but I also, I work mostly in Ecuador, in the tropics, um, right on the equator. Um, and the diversity of Xylaria is, is stunning here. Uh, I'm actually in Ecuador right now. Uh, we're at the tail end of a, a field work trip here for uh, not for working on fungi, but for working on a documentary film. Um, and, you know, Xylarias, they come in all these different shapes and sizes. The Center for Diversity um, is here in the tropics in the New World, um, although it's mirrored uh, by a Center for Diversity in the Old World as well um, in, in Africa and Southeast Asia. And these are important fungi for lots of reasons. Uh, and so I want us to take a step back for a moment and recognize that plants are not just plants. Um, every time you see a green leaf from a plant, you're not just looking at an, a single organism with a single genome. That plant has a microbiome, just like you have a microbiome in your gut. And so the endophytes, Endo is the Greek root for inside, and phyte, of course, is the root for plant. So endophytes are those organisms that live within the living tissues of the plants. And so just as humans have a microbiome, thousands of species of mostly bacteria that live in our guts, plants have a microbiome, thousands of species of mostly fungi that live within their leaves. Uh, and so xylaria are particularly important fungi because they're common ubiquitous endophytes. Every leaf you see in this picture contains dozens or hundreds of species of fungi. And of those, almost every leaf will have a xylaria of some species within it. They're very, very common, particularly in the tropics. They're also incredibly important fungi because they are ubiquitous wood decay fungi. They're one of the few lineages of ascomycetes that is capable of physiological white rot. So these are fungi that decay the lignin within the wood. And in Ecuador, where I work, they are the most common wood decay fungi. If you see a piece of rotting wood on the forest floor, chances are it will have a xylaria fruiting from it. So these are very important fungi for two reasons, common ubiquitous plant symbionts and some of the most important fungi involved in global carbon cycling is wood decay fungi, which begs the question, why is a common wood decomposer also a common endophyte? It's not an obvious, there's not an obvious answer, but I think 
that the answer is that endophytism can be used as a means of dispersal. And so this is our model. We call it the foraging ascomycete hypothesis. It was proposed by Dr. George Carroll in the late 1990s, but it wasn't tested until we tested it in Ecuador a few years ago. And so here's how the model works. You start with the Xylaria fruiting on dead wood. They create ascospores in the parathesia and those spores disperse. Now, the majority of them probably just disperse directly back to wood, but some of them disperse up into the forest canopy into leaves and initiate endophyte infections. And so everything above this line is in the endophytic stage of the fungus's lifestyle, the fungus's life cycle, excuse me. Uh, there's this possibility for leaf to leaf uh, amplification dispersal. We've never observed this in Xylaria, but we have seen it in other common fungal endophytes. But then the more interesting part is when these leaves, the entire leaf, when the leaf is shed from the tree, it disperses back to the forest floor and the fungi can grow out from the leaf and colonize wood and the cycle can begin again. And so this is important because this kind of endophyte dispersal provides several advantages. Um, the biggest being persistence in the environment. If there's a, a, a lack of suitable substrate in the forest floor or environmental conditions that are unfavorable for spore germination or substrate colonization, the presence as endophytes gives this fungus the ability to bridge these gaps. It also can provide increased dispersal distances as leaves fall a lot farther from their tree on average than a fungal spore falls from the fruiting body that made it. There is, however, this other issue where uh, chaotic air currents can push fungal spores much further uh, at a much lower concentration than leaves fall from trees. So that's kind of a mixed benefit. Um, amplification, you know, the endophyte colony grows within the leaf. Even though it's a very low metabolic rate, uh, you end up with a living colony of fungus instead of a single spore. There's also this idea of an adventitious microclimate. A leaf on a piece of dead wood provides a dark, humid environment underneath of it. And this leaf with the endophyte inside of it also provides protection from competitive incoming inocula from other fungi. Right? And so if we wanna test this hypothesis, we have to know what species of Xylaria are present in a given area. And we have to know if there's any spatial patterning to their distribution. We would expect under this hypothesis for there to be a spatial relationship between endophytes found in the forest canopy and fruiting fungi on the forest floor because of dispersal limitation. We also need to know if there is host specificity. In Ecuador, the, forests, the forest canopy is hyper diverse. There is no single dominant tree species. We're talking, where I work in Los Cedros, there are 300 tree species per hectare of forest. So for this to be a general dispersal strategy, we would expect host generalism. So how did we test this? We went to Reserva Los Cedros, here in Ecuador, this is a this is a an aerial or this is a photograph from up on the ridge of the research station. You can see the building here. Uh, it's in this uh, what we call cloud forest. Uh, it's the zone of elevation where the clouds condense. It's about twelve hundred meters of elevation. Um, Ecuador, here, this is a world map of global plant diversity. Ecuador is per square mile the most biodiverse country on Earth. And Los Cedros is here on the western slope of the Andes. Uh, it's one of the most deforested parts um, of this habitat. They call it the Choco bioregion. And within Ecuador, there's only about three or 4% of this habitat left. So it's a very endangered habitat, hyper diverse. And Los Cedros protected forest is extremely remote. So to do this work, we go out to this, this tiny town from the city called Chantal. Um, where the road ends 
Uh, and the mules come down from the reserve and meet us at the end of the road where we bundle all of our scientific equipment up onto the mules. And then we hike with the mules for several hours up this muddy track um, and into this pristine, untouched, protected forest. Um, it, it's incredible. I've never been anywhere else like it in the world. Um, it has uh, some of the, the greatest diversity anywhere in the world. Ecuador actually has 17% of all the bird species in the world can be found in Ecuador, including this endemic choco tucan and these in, endangered rosy-faced parrots. Uh, Reserva Los Cedros is one of the only places in Ecuador where you can find all three species of Western monkeys, uh, including this white-faced capuchin, which is um, also, in all three species are endangered. Um, the diversity of amphibians is incredible. These glass frogs are a testament. Uh, so we went to this incredibly diverse forest um, and we wanted to do this eco ecological experiment. So we initiated a spatially explicit grid system. Um, and for every point on the grid, uh, we did a 1.2 meter radius and we collected all of the xylaria that we found within that circle, 1.2 meter radius. So it's a relatively large area. Um, we did this 120 times across this grid in this forest. And then we collected the two lowest hanging leaves from the closest canopy tree to the center of each grid point. So we had, you know, it just doesn't matter what the tree species was, it mattered where the tree species was. Um, and we only did two because the amount of work we were able to accomplish was finite. It would have been nice to do more and it would have been nice to do canopy stratification as well. Um, we went with the lowest leaves because we thought it would provide us the highest probability of finding the decomposer fungi as endophytes. Because that's what we're interested in. It's the spatial linkage between the endophytic fungi and the decomposer fungi. And then we used ITS sequence to match specifically the fruiting bodies on the forest floor with the endophyte cultures from the leaves. Uh, the idea being, if you find you know, species A fruiting in your grid in a couple of points, and you find species B fruiting in your grid in a couple of points, and then you find those same species existing as endophytes within the leaves, at particular points in the grid, you can then put those spatial distributions of the fruiting bodies and the endophytes together uh, and, and draw conclusions. Do they cluster or not? We can tell whether or not there is a spatial linkage between these two life stages. So this is actually our study site. This is primary cloud forest in Ecuador. Um, it's a relatively high disturbance system um, because of the amount of rainfall. Uh, it rains almost four meters a year here. Uh, it's a lot of rainfall. Uh, this is a representation of our study site. Like I said, 120 grid points. The size of the points here represent the opening of the canopy. You can see there's a tree fall here. There's a very small stream that runs through our site. There's streams everywhere because of how much it rains. Uh, you could step, it's less than a meter. You could step right over it. Um, you could step right in it without worrying about getting water in your boots. Um, and then the, uh, the arrows point downhill. Um, so you can see the, overall the site was relatively flat except for a couple of steep spaces along the edge of this tiny stream. And then we went out and we collected every single Xylaria we could find. We made more than 600 fungal collections um, over the course of this study. Uh, this is myself, uh, and my colleague Dan Thomas collecting fungi. Um, this is our botanist, uh, Danilo Simba, who's an Ecuadorian botanist. Uh, you need a trained local botanist when you're doing this kind of work, because like I said, there are 300 species of tree per hectare. And even though our plot is only half a hectare, almost every single tree species that we sampled um, was different. And so we needed a botanist to be able to identify the host trees. And we collected Xylaria. So many beautiful, beautiful Xylaria. We actually ended up collecting in the space of half of a hectare, 36 species of Xylaria. Uh, the diversity is just stunning. Um, for comparison, where I live in the state of Oregon in the United States, uh, we have um, 
three known species of Xylaria in the whole state. <laughs> so this is incredible. This is Xylaria telfarii, uh, which is fascinating because it uh, creates this gelatinous interior, which is theorized to be a water retention mechanism to help with spore dispersal. Uh, Xylaria globosa uh, is easily recognizable because it has these bright red exudates when it's in its young phase. Xylaria tucumanensis, which is extremely small. Uh, this entire fruiting body is only two millimeters in height and it's been sectioned so you can very clearly see the almost naked parathesia with their load of darkly melanized spores inside. Um, Xylaria tucumanensis, uh, up until this study, uh, was previously only known from Argentina. So we expanded its range to include Ecuador as well. Uh, this is a fascinating Xylaria from bamboo. This appears to be an undescribed species that we're working on. Uh, but in addition to Xylarias, we also collected these two lowest leaves from the nearest tree uh, for culturing endophytes. And so we collected leaves from all kinds of different host species, um, both large and small, um, you know, a wide range of different possible endophyte hosts. And then we did something absolutely absurd. In the middle of the jungle, we set up a fungal culture laboratory and we cultured endophytes from every each of those leaves, two leaves from 120 points. So we had 240 leaves and from each leaf, we took three subsamples. Uh, and so that makes uh, more than 500 subsamples, which were then cultured and fungi isolated. All told, we ended up with a culture library of more than 1500 cultures um, in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> Uh, and we cultured Xylarias. This is a Xylaria endophyte in culture. They make absolutely beautiful, uh, this cottony white with these concentric zones. As they age, they start to create this black carbonized area, much like the fruiting bodies. Uh, we also cultured all kinds of other endophytes. You know, Xylaria are common and ubiquitous, but they're not the dominant endophyte. The most common endophyte was, a, a, was the genus Colotatricum. Uh, which is what this is, uh, colocotrichum is the way some people say it. Uh, Latin, you know, you can pronounce it however you like. Um, and so, so what did we find? Uh, what did we find? Um, this is our collector's curves. So we had 120 plots, and this is the number of OTUs, you can think of it as species, for both the saprotrophic fungi, uh, which is the, the Xylaria fruiting bodies we collected, uh, and for the endophytic fungi. And what you can see really clearly here is that there are a much greater diversity of fungi present as decomposers than there are present as endophytes. This fits our theory. We would expect the endophytic fungi using this ecological strategy to be a subset of the total decomposer diversity. All told, we found 36 species of Xylaria. Um, of which two are liable to be new species. We're still working on those new species. Five, we found five species that were endophytes. And from this figure, I think there's two things that are important to understand. All five of the species we found as endophytes, we also found as decomposers fruiting on the forest floor. The endophytes are a subset of the decomposers. That's important because it fits our theory. The other thing that's important is that the most common endophyte is not the most common fruiting Xylaria. Uh, and so the, the presence, the abundance as endophytes in the canopy is not a direct result of just the abundance of, of fruiting fungi on the forest floor. It is the result of ecological strategy. And so, I wanna tell you about those five species that we found as both endophytes and as decomposers. The first is Xylaria apiculata, uh, which you can see fruiting here. Um, it's called apiculata for these little apiculate tips. And you can see the anamorphic, the asexual stage with these hand-like projections. Uh, this, is, this is an illustration. I like to illustrate the fungi that I work with. Um, you can see clearly the the spores are, are important identifying features, as is the uh, iodine staining apical apparatus. Um, and this is the map, this is our study site. Um, and you can see everywhere we found it fruiting on the forest floor occurring as a decomposer and where we found it as an endophyte. We actually only recovered Xylaria piculata as an endophyte once. And so there's, there's a couple of things that are important about this map. Um, 
the most important, I think, is if you just, when you look at the spatial distribution of where these fungi are fruiting, um, to my mind, you see a pattern with the stream. And so I want you to keep that in mind because we're gonna come back to that pattern with the stream. The second fungus is Xyleria adsendens. Xyleria adsendens was our most common endophyte by far. And we only found it fruiting on the site three times um, and pretty much only in the conidial stage, in the young stage. Um, only, only this one spot was it also in its parathecial stage. Um, Xyleria, uh, yeah, it's kind of like Xyleria curta. We're calling it Xyleria af curta. Um, we found fruiting twice uh, and as an endophyte once. Um, you know, and what we're doing with these spatial distributions is we're trying to put together, uh, is it more likely that these fruiting bodies are closer to these endophyte infections than you would expect from chance? And so we use what's called permutational nearest neighbor statistics to, per to permutate different versions of this map where the fungi are randomly distributed and determine is the actual distance from the endophyte to the fruiting bodies less than or greater than you might expect from a random distribution across the landscape. Uh, we represent that here, the distance from the endophyte to the fruiting bodies to its nearest neighbor. Uh, and this, the gray box represents um, a 95 confident, a 95% confidence interval that they are closer together than you expect by chance. Um, and so in this case with Celeria afkerta, we find that indeed, even though there's only one endophyte infection, because we're using permutational methods, we can have confidence that this endophyte infection occurs closer to both of these two stromata than you expect by chance. Uh, likewise, Xyleria fistulus. Xyleria fistulus is beautiful Xyleria. You can always recognize it because of these horizontal constrictions, uh, which you know you can see in the illustration here, is a result of the way the parathesia form uh, with gaps between them. Xyleria fistulus was one of the most widely distributed fruiting bodies of Xyleria, uh, with endophytes also relatively widely distributed. And Xyleria fistulus also, at the second distance order, we see evidence that they are more closely clustered than you expect from chance. Xyleria atrospherica, which is this little, they're almost inconsequential Xylarias. Um, similarly, you know, we see these four Xyleria fruiting across the site uh, and one endophyte cluster. Um, and this one, I, I wanna come back to this idea of the influence of the stream. We can use the same permutational nearest neighbor methods to examine whether or not the fruiting bodies or the endophytes occur closer to the stream than you might expect from chance, um, right? And we had all these other site measures as well, right? The canopy openings, the slope of the hill, the aspect, was it south facing or north facing? Um, you know, all of this environmental data. Um, and what we found was really the stream was the, the largest single effect. And that three of these five xylarias that occur in both life stages we find evidence that they occur closer to the stream than you expect from chance in Xyleria afkerta, Xyleria piculata, and Xyleria atrospherica. But the endophytes for all five show no difference from random. No difference from random, right? They're, they're not outside that confidence window. Now, the other part of our hypothesis, this foraging ascomycete hypothesis had to do with host specificity. Because this is a hyperdiverse forest, we would expect Xyleria is utilizing the endophytic life stage as a dispersal mechanism to need to be host generalists. And indeed, this is a bipartite network where you see the hosts on the left and the five Xyleria species on the right uh, the, the width of the bars represent how many points we found them at, right? So Xyleria descendens was our most common endophyte. We found it in the largest number of hosts as a consequence. And you can do, there's a statistical test uh, for these bipartite networks um, looking for structure in the network. 
And what we find is that this is what we call an unstructured bipartite network, which means there is no evidence for host specificity. Each of these xylarias you find in a random subset of the available hosts. And so we find evidence supporting this foraging ascomycete hypothesis um, in that the stromata are restricted by environmental factors, in this case, the distance to the stream, where the endophytes are not, they're freed from environmental constraints. We find in two of these five species, uh, in, remember in only a very small study, just a half a hectare, we find two of these five species show evidence of spatial linkage between the stromata fruiting on the ground and the endophytes growing in the culture. You're growing in the, in the canopy, right? And then we find in the endophytes evidence of host generalism. These, all three of these uh, avenues of evidence support this hypothesis, but they're all on this side. They're all this linkage between the stromata and the endophytes. What about this last linkage, linkage C, where the ability for the endophytes to disperse from the forest canopy back to, to wood on the forest floor? Well, we did a very simple follow-up experiment where we took leaves from a tree at Los Cedros, we surface sterilized them using bleach and hydrogen peroxide. Um, and then we placed those leaves on sterile autoclaved woody, wooden baits, uh, just tongue depressors from the doctor's office. Um, and we allowed the end fights to grow from the leaves into the wood. After uh, two months of growth, uh, the wood was harvested, taken back to the laboratory and incubated uh, for up to six months on just plain water auger petri dishes, just to keep them moist. Uh, and what you see here is part of one of those woody baits with two stromata from a xylaria fruiting directly from the wood. This xylaria originated as an endophyte. And so that final linkage is proven as well. Uh, all of this work has been published. Uh, uh, the paper is called Spatial Ecology of the Fungal Genus Xylaria in a Tropical Cloud Forest. It's in the journal Biotropica. If you have trouble um, accessing the paper, uh, let me know. I can send you a PDF. It's very easy. Uh, and you'll notice the, the cover for this issue actually was that photograph of Xylaria tucumanensis that we uh, extend, extended the range for. Uh, you know, there's another aspect though to my work in Ecuador. Yeah, this work at Los Cedros. Only a yeah. few minutes left for you. Only a few minutes, few minutes. left for you. Ah. Ah, including the questions. Okay, well, very briefly then, um, in Ecuador, uh, the amount of land available to mining has expanded greatly, 300% in the last two years, and Reserva Los Cedros, where this work took place, is now under mining concession. Uh, mining exploration is currently happening across all of Ecuador and at Los Cedros. We published a paper on the risks of these new mining concessions. Uh, to the biodiversity and ecosystem services in Ecuador as a conglomerate with a, a big group of researchers, uh, including many of our Ecuadorian colleagues who are concerned about this, uh, as well as a, a white paper report uh, on the extent of these new mining concessions, analyzing how they go. Uh, we published this in Spanish as well to make sure it was accessible to our colleagues in Ecuador. Um, and then I should acknowledge uh, most of my funding for this work came from small mycological societies, the Mycological Society of America, the Cascade Mycological Society, Sonoma County Mycological Society, Oregon Mycological Society. Um, and, and so the, the work that these small mycological societies do is absolutely essential to the progress of mycology. Um, and I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart. Um, I want to thank Dr. Yuming Zhu, who's the world expert on Xylaria in Taiwan. I got to spend a summer with him. Uh, I have to thank everybody, Pat Bartline in particular for the statistics, everybody from Los Cedros, um, and everybody, all of our Ecuadorian collaborators at the Museum of Natural Sciences uh, and INABIO, which is the Ecuadorian National Institute for Biodiversity, uh, at which I am an associate researcher. And with that, I can take any questions if we have any time left. If there is any question, we will go afterwards. So thank you, Dr. Ru. And uh, I'm extremely thankful to you because both the time you have accepted, really accepted our invitation. First at last month when we have the, your presentation at MSI Mumbai unit and as for today also. 
thank you very much for your good presentation so we have next speaker dr ns atri uh, atri sir is retired from department of botany punjabi university patiala he has more than 37 years of experience published around 150 papers phd 1985 from punjabi university patiala on studies on northwest himalayan rasilesi he he has guided around 14 phd 10 mphils and 7 msc students he was coordinator examination co coordinator for slet and jet examination professor and head department of botany and chairman undergraduate and postgraduate of board of studies botany punjab university patiala from 2011 to 2014 chairman board of studies agriculture punjab university patiala member academic council and member standing committee academic council punjab university patiala apart from this his he was the past president of mycological society of india and the present status of the kavaka goes to his credit because he has brought this journal up to a certain stage i welcome professor atri with this in brief introduction so good morning everybody am i audible please yes yes you are audible good morning yes, sir and you are audible yes sir yes sir good morning audible sir good morning atri sir you are audible yes my screen is visible sir yes yes sir okay okay thank you thank you so at the outset i like to acknowledge the support from punjabi university patiala and the department of botany punjabi university patiala where i worked throughout my life i studied here i came here in 1976 and continued up till 2020 december 2020 so whatever work i'll be presenting here Uh, it is uh, all done here at punjabi university patiala by my students and subsequently after completing my tenure here uh, in december 2020 i shifted to solan where i joined for a short while uh, a private university and i have left that although but uh, because the work was sent from there so that is why i have uh, <laughs> yes so i am presenting it here and the affiliation i have given of both the institution punjab university patiala and, and the shuli university uh, at uh, solan so as for i have worked throughout my life on mushrooms i will be presenting uh, the uh, role of mushrooms in society that is what the title i have selected mushrooms in service of the society my work has been uh, already Uh, done easier by professor tian lakhanpal yesterday because whatever i am i will be presenting today about 90% of it was presented by professor tian lakhanpal he is 
he is my teacher and uh, hope uh, i'll be you'll not be uh, getting bored because this almost the same thing i'll be repeating today that was a sheer coincidence that the things uh, overlapped by chance and some of the work uh, which uh, dr kapoor also uh, referred to about mycorrhiza a brief uh, idea about mycorrhiza i'll be presenting as for mushrooms are concerned mushrooms have been referred as incredible creation of god by none other than st tang because of the benefits which we draw from mushrooms so lamellate mushrooms basically uh, they represent large group of macro fungi growing above ground and they emerge out from the below ground mycelium through fruiting process it is estimated that about 2.2 to 3.8 million fungi including mushrooms exist in nature out of which we only know about 7 to 8% and the estimated number of mushrooms is around 60000 out of which approximately 16000 mushroom species are reported to have been described and out of these approximately 7000 mushrooms are reported to be of having varying degree of edibility and more than 3000 species spread over 31 genera are regarded as prime edible we published one documentary of agaricomyces mushrooms of india in 2017 along with professor tn lakhanpal and director of mushroom research solan and there were uh, as many as around pro approximately 2000 agaricomyces mushrooms so far described from india although india itself presents a rich depository of mushrooms which needs to be investigated and worked out from india about 300 edible species belonging to 70 genera are documented and about 80 mushrooms have been grown experimentally and of, out of which only 4 to 5 are produced at industrial scale historical aspects were already presented by professor lakhanpal we know that the mushrooms their relevance was recognized in 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 the scriptures and inscriptions of various civilizations over a period of time their utility as food as medicine is well recognized and nutritionists started investigating mushrooms after the second world war when food storage became very severe and the need was felt to look for alternative sources of food so now there is an increased awareness about the nutritional and medicinal benefits of mushrooms and we know that they are an important source of various bioactive molecules which have utility against variety of ailments including diabetes obesity hypertension cancer aids etc and uh, they are being viewed as special creation of god because of these advantages which we draw from them as for uh, their occurrence is concerned they are capable of occupying variety of ecological niches you find them growing on soil in grassy lawns they are terrestrial many of them are lignicolous hemicolous coprophyllous mycorrhizal entomogenous parasitic even hypogeous and all varieties categories including edible inedible poisonous decorative mysterious etc they are uh, well represented and have variable benefits as far as nutritional and nutraceutical uh, advantages are concerned as for their relevance to society is concerned the society is facing variety of key issues key problems uh, as far as environmental deterioration is concerned and the quality of food is concerned health quality of health is concerned employment inadequate resources are concerned and these uh, microbes mushrooms they have ready solution they provide us a uh, solution for all these uh, problems which the society is facing which includes uh, helping ecosystem in nature's replenisher nature scavengers bioconversion etc had these microbes not been there earth would have been a pile of debris so they are uh, important they add to the fertility of the soil and they add to the nature's uh, replenishment uh, upon which we all thrive so they help in uh, revitalization or replenishment of the uh, ecosystem in which we all uh, are part of it 
they are source of a high quality food and they have medicinal value and provide occupation and a source of revenue so people um, collect these mushrooms from the wild a few of them are being cultivated at commercial level and all these are uh, the source of revenue for them they provide a source of additional income as for ecosystem i'll come to these points one by one giving some examples from our own studies and also from literature so helping ecosystem basically ecosystem uh, faces some of the major concerns including establishment and growth and development of things and depletion of natural resources loss of habitat use of toxic substances in the environment and mushrooms provide a uh, solution uh, for all these problems which the ecosystem is facing mushroom is a significant tool for restoration replenishment and remediation of our overburdened ecospheres because of their uh, inherent capability to produce hello 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 these form a wood wide web and which has relevance in 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 growth and development of uh, forest basically we'll come to it later on we have, we have surveyed whole of the northwest himalayas and we have found that there are specific mushroom uh, species which you find specifically growing along with a specific tree we have surveyed uh, devdar forest we have surveyed pine forest we have surveyed oak forest abies for us all these and we have found some of these species forming uh, very close association with number of trees and some of them are highly specific uh, in this and looking into these we try to evaluate their relevance in the plant growth so as for their uh, role in ecosystem replenishment is concerned we know uh, large many of them are decomposers they are saprophytic and they are primary colonizers of the woody substrates wooden logs etc like oyster mushrooms like uh, various species of lentinus lentinula strophaeria rugoso annulata etc they colonize woody logs or uh, and help them in in uh, converting them into uh, soil basically and subsequently on to the uh, woody logs decomposed by these mushrooms there are secondary colonizers like various species of agaricus etc strophaeria etc which come up on them and they they basically colonize the composted material which is composted by the primary decomposers and subsequently we have secondary uh, colonizers and then tertiary colonizers so all these basically helps in converting the dead organic matter into uh, utility product and and, and the, add to the uh, strength of the soil basically adds to the fertility of the soil so mushrooms are an important tool in understanding biodiversity the species richness is uh, related to mushrooms because large number of them approximately 85 to 90% of the plant they form Uh, association with fungi and we have uh, specifically mycorrhizal association developing which helps in uh, managing various uh, advantages to the plant as was discussed by professor rupam kapoor yesterday i'll not be repeating all those advantages and uh, we have worked on uh, ectomycorrhiza and mycorrhiza part was discussed by professor rupam kapoor and uh, as far as ectomycorrhiza is concerned you have these higher fungi specifically mushrooms they form uh, this ecm association with the uh, plants and the challenges facing nursery industry like poor establishment and survival of seedlings in this aspect these mushrooms play an important role they provide a ready solution for improvement in the establishment growth and development of seedlings of multi purpose plants which has direct relevance to the society by forming association ecm association they help in increasing the productivity of multi purpose plants thereby helping in meeting the increasing demand in the 
society. There are variety of reasons for failure in the natural regeneration and establishment of seeds like recalcitrant nature of seeds. In many of the plants uh, like sal, uh, there is a precocious germination of seeds on the plant itself when they are still attached to the plant. When they fall onto the soil, there's a lot of leaf litter below and seeds fails to connect with the soil and hence there is a problem in establishment. Post recruitment rot is there, heavy leaf litter on the first floor, heavy metal pollution in the soil. So these uh, mushrooms, they provide ready solution for, for, for see these problems which the plants are facing. Seeds immediately need appropriate nutrient when they fall onto the soil and mycorrhiza help in establishment. In this regard, we have studied uh, these aspects uh, with, while working with SAL, and we have found that the number of species are approximately uh, 25 mushroom species, uh, those of Rasula, Lactarius, Lactifluus, Inocybe, et cetera, they form very close a uh, putative mycorrhizal association with SAL plants. And they have been seen to improve SAL seedling establishment and performance, and also, um, protection from heavy metal stress. This was uh, published in some journals. And we have found that these are the genera, Rasula, Lactarius, Lactifluus, Bolitus, Agaricus, Amanita, Inocybe, et cetera, which are uh, forming putative mycorrhizal association with these, uh, with uh, SAL specifically. The species of above mushrooms are reported to play a wider role in the establishment and growth of not only sal, but also number of other multipurpose trees, including cedrus, including abies, and Professor and Lakhanpal has worked a lot on it. While working with sal, we have found more than 25 uh, species of mushrooms forming close association with these, and we studied their uh, morphological, morphoanatomical details and all these things and close association, we collected these mushrooms and subsequently uh, internal details were studied and we found that there's a close association and we identified three mushrooms uh, forming very close association. One is Rasula sinusantha, another is Rasula uh, canadai, and third one is a species of Lactiplus, which turned out to be a new species and we have published it. It is accepted in Nova Hadwigia. Uh, it is Lactiplus. Uh, Shivali Kansas. And uh, we raised, semi we raised uh, spawn of these mushrooms. And uh, this is Rasula sinusantha, Rasula canadai, and Lactifluus Shivali Kansas. And the spawn was raised and seeds were uh, collected. And you can see the uh, germinating seeds. The seedlings are apparent on these seeds. There's a precocious germination. There's a lot of leaf litter below. And this poses a problem. And we set up an experiment in the field at Dehradun. And uh, with all the three uh, putative ECM associates and these <laughs> controls, which we <laughs> and subsequently seedlings was raised. And uh, uh, the, the growth pattern was uh, evaluated after every three months. You can see the variation. These are the two controls. And these are the three ECM associates. And we could find a lot of. Uh, uh, you can say advantages which the plant has drawn from the association with the fungus with every aspects including uh, the fresh weight dry weight of every part was noted and uh, all parameters which are uh, required to be noted so as to see the impact of ECM association with the plant were noted and we found that these are the parameters which we uh, ultimately evaluated percent survival, total length of the seed, seedling volume, length of the shoot and root, number of uh, roots, number of mycorrhizal roots, percentage mycorrhizal colonization, fresh weight, etc. All these things, all these and the results were statistically analyzed. And we found that the species of Sula and Lactifluus are common ECM associates of soil. And all the major growth parameters of seedling grown in artificially inoculated soil treatments exhibited significantly higher value of uh, as compared to uninoculated control soil and all the three ECM fungi used during present investigation uh, exhibited significant higher growth uh, but overall 
Rasula Sinozentha showed maximum growth in comparison to other two ECM associates. And the maximum ECM association was observed with Rasula Sinozentha. And mycorrhizal inoculation effect was also observed and was found maximum with Rasula Sinozentha. Negative correlation was observed uh, between mycorrhizal inoculation effect and the nutrient content of the soil. So nutrient analysis of the soil seedlings revealed increased uptake of these macro and micronutrients in the roots and shoots of artificial inoculated seedlings than the natural inoculum and the control. And the plant inoculated with ECM have low concentration of heavy metals like chromium, copper, aluminum in shoots as compared to control. So survival rate also increased from 50% to 95%. And the higher growth and survival in inoculated seedlings is primarily due to the mobilization of additional nutrients, water, and protection from the pathogenic fungi by associated mycorrhizal fungi, as was uh, demonstrated yesterday through field experiments by uh, Professor Rupam Kapoor. So, hence, artificial inoculum of uh, inoculation of Shoria robusta seedlings with these ECM fungal species led to enhanced growth and development, which is quite important for regeneration and survival of this plant, it has got huge relevance because it is a multi-purpose tree as far as society is concerned. Besides this, mushroom mycelium nowadays is being used uh, extensively uh, to prepare packaging material. Over 300 million metric tons of polystyrene were produced globally for packaging, which needs replacement because of being non-biodegradable. So mycelium form is a base material for all the mycelial products. So mushroom mycelium packaging material is incredibly innovative, uh, environment friendly material with several advantages over styrofoam. So unlike styrofoam, mushroom mycelium packaging material is 100% biodegradable and renewable. So mycelium foam is a flame resistant, hydrophobic, insulating and breathable material and, and uh, it is sustainable, inexpensive and abundant. Mycoflex and myco Composite are 100% pure mycelial products, which are in use, uh, being uh, used as replacement for this particular <coughs> packaging material. Then bioconversion is an important aspect. So we know that the huge amount of organic debris, which is being generated every year through various agricultural activities, and over 500 million tons of crop residue. Uh, is available annually, a large amount of which is being burnt and that creates a lot of uh, air pollution. So there is a huge problem about this. And uh, uh, in this purpose, a large amount of potent source of organic carbon and nutrient is being lost. If only 1% of it is utilized uh, in India, India will be one of the major uh, producer of mushrooms, specifically if it is utilized for production of mushrooms. So. Agro wastes, every agro waste, think of any, any organic material, these mushrooms are capable of colonizing these. Um, and uh, this is basically an important aspect of converting uh, dead organic matter into utility product. And ultimately it leads to uh, formation of uh, soil, which is rich in nutrients and fertile. Besides this, you draw a number of other advantages. You get government mushrooms, you uh, get medicinal mushrooms, you can, uh, it leads to bioremediation of uh, pollutants from the soil and you get clean soil with enriched protein and other constituents uh, in the soil as compared to normal composting. This is a direct advantage which you can draw. There are a number of mushrooms and uh, uh, which are edible. Four of them are being cultivated in India, including Ericus bisporus, Pleurota species, Calosibi, Volverella, and now Shitake is also there. It has come up. Professor Garcha, H.S. Garcha, has recommended this, this cycle for uh, cultivation of mushrooms in Punjab, mid-November to mid-March, Ericus bisporus. 
and mid February to mid April pleurotus azure kaju, mid June to mid September Volvilla Wallacea, September to November pleurotus azure kaju. So you can have a year round cycle of mushroom cultivation, which can add to your, uh, you can say income. And besides this, it also helps in recycling of the agro waste. So it is a huge advantage, which is associated uh, multifarious advantages these mushrooms uh, give us. So these are the temperate mushrooms which can prefer the uh, cooler climate, agaricus bispur, lentinula roads, plamulana, velutipus, and technology for their cultivation is available at DMR Solon. So subtropical mushrooms like pleurotus, agaricus bitorquis, auricularia, species of macrolepiota, and tropical calocybe indica, volvariella, ganoderma lucidum, uh, Dr. Krishnamurti has done a lot of work on calocybe indica. And besides this, for all these, we have technology available at Directorate of Mushrooms. We worked with a number of Lantina species and we domesticated them. We worked with common agriculture substrates available in Punjab, including wheat straw, rice straw, sawdust, rice husk, etc. And we could get a good, you can say, biological efficiency. This is one slide I have shown here with Lantina squarosulus. You can see the growth on 68% biological efficiency we could get in, in, in case of Lentinus cladopus, equally about 79% biological efficiency we could get here. Lentinus conatus also we cultivated, Lentinus uh, torulosus and, and Lentinus cystidiosus. All these, besides this Lentinus sejor kaju also, and on very wooden substrates, and they are capable of colonizing and, and converting them into utility products. So nutritional value of mushroom, we all understand, and Professor Lakhanpal has amply explained yesterday, there are a number of advantages which these mushrooms uh, offer to us as far as nutritional value is concerned, being low calorie, high protein, uh, dietary fibers, and vitamins. And these contain substantial amount of protein and out of which about 87-88% is digestible protein. Good source of insoluble fibers in the form of chitin and, and uh, non-starch polysaccharide like beta-glucans, mainly low fat, good source of unsaturated fatty acids. And uh, uh, although the fat content is very low and no cholesterol, it is rich in linoleic acid and uh, cholesterol is altogether absent. Uh, fairly good source of vitamin C and vitamin B complex, particularly thiamine, riboflavin, uh, biotin, pantothenic acid, folic acid, vitamin B12. And besides this, there is a amino potentiating this uh, beta-glucan, lantinan, which is present at good source of uh, minerals uh, like uh, copper, like selenium, like potassium, which have direct advantage as far as health. Uh, human health is concerned. This is the profile of, nutritional profile of agaricus bisporus. Uh, uh, you can see zero cholesterol and other blood building vitamins, niacin is there, folic acid is there, and uh, minerals are there, all these are there. And if you, when you compare these with, with the, uh, this profile of mushroom with other vegetables, you find mushrooms being low calorie, calorie, you can see the fat content, carbohydrate, and a high protein content, almost comparable to, to uh, beans. So that is what the advantages we draw. There are a number of wild mushrooms upon we, uh, in which uh, Professor Lakhanpal has worked extensively. We have also done some work on sociobiological aspects. And these mushrooms, they offer a huge resource for domestication. And there are a number of species which are being collected from the wild and, and they are, uh, many of them are being sold uh, by the people in, in the roadside markets, specifically in Northeast, in Chhattisgarh, in Madhya Pradesh, etc. Uh, they are being sold and we have found them uh, almost uh, as for taste is concerned. Uh, even better than the those cultivated mushrooms like uh, Co Coprinus cometus is here, and you have Marcella here, like that. The number of other mushrooms, Termitomyces species are there, which are very important as far as their nutritional properties are concerned, and we have found them, they are being sold by the vegetable vendors while working on sociobiology of these mushrooms. And you can see this is a Termitomyces uh, uh, here, Hemiae. 
uh, which was uh, named by Professor Natarajan and in, in Madhya Pradesh, in, in other markets, they are, it is being sold at a high premium. Uh, and uh, uh, Marshala, Professor Lakhanpal has worked on sociobiology of this particular mushrooms and uh, the market price of dried mushroom extend up to from 20,000 to uh, 40,000 now. Uh, it is there. This is, and every part of this mushroom uh, fetches a premium. It has a premium, may it be head, may it be head and uh, stipe, and every part has got a premium. This is Termitomyces microcarpus. It is being collected from the field and it's being uh, consumed by the people. This is shaggy mane, Coprinitus cometus. We have found it being sold here in Sharpur, in, in, in Rajpura market, even at Patiala. One of our clerks in the university used to bring uh, samples from Rajpura uh, here, Patiala. These are the slides uh, which uh, we have published together with the Ashpal, Dr. Ashpal Sharma and Dr. Sanjeev Paul. This, this is their slide and this is how the geopora is being uh, collected and it is being preserved and uh, this is ter by lacing turmeric and uh, salt uh, for off season, off season. And this is how the people are uh, collecting these from the wild and uh, using them during off season. This is termitomyces microcarpus which is being collected by an individual and the social two minutes left. are being noted. Just I, I required three, four minutes. These are the sociobiological aspects uh, which are here, uh, which were noted, uh, their local name, their technical name, their trivial name, their edibility status, etc. All these are noted uh, in the field itself and it offers you a lot of information and it is a source of revenue during off season. We worked at various species of termitomyces for their nutritional profile and uh, uh, compared them with common vegetables and we could find that they have a high amount of protein as compared to common vegetables almost as compared to soya bean and uh, fiber content is also uh, good there but fat is low. So medicinal utility, medicinally they are important, uh, they are uh, having uh, certain uh, substances which are host defense potentiators and they have protein bound polysaccharides which are very important they help in revitalization of immune system they serve as biological response modifiers with capabilities to activate macrophages and t cells and produce cytokines introleukins and tumor necrosis factors they have been used in folk medicines these are the mushrooms which have been used in folk medicines these are the folk names and these are the uh, ailments against which they were being recommended, they were being used over a period of time. Traditionally, and Dr. Harsh has worked a lot at Parai and Dr. Vaidya from Pune. He has done a lot of work on these aspects. As for nutrition, nutraceutical uh, properties of mushrooms are concerned, these are some of the species of mushrooms, Ganoderma, Herisium, Cordyceps, Lentinus, etc., Lentinula, and these are the medicinal uses and uh, uh, which are uh, listed against individual mushrooms. You can see the number of advantages which uh, we draw, we can draw from these mushrooms. These are the active principles uh, which have been identified, which have of medicinal utility in individual mushrooms. Uh, these are the active principles in individual mushrooms which have been identified. And this is one Ganoderma, and Dr. Lakhanpal has talked about it. And uh, for almost all sorts of ailments, you have Ganoderma capsules which are available against diabetes, rheumatism, cancer, general health maintenance, etc. They are available. Gryphola frondosa is another. Gryphon prodi, which is immunopotentiating, it is available in the form of mitic fraction in the market. Tremetis versi color, you have PSK, an anti cancer drug from this particular mushroom, which is very important. There are other mushrooms also with medicinal utility, which has a number of advantages. Besides mushroom production and consumption is an important aspect, which is uh, 
of immense utility uh, for us all. And uh, we have to increase its consumption by popularizing these mushrooms. There are mushroom-based food products, bakery products, uh, bread, bake, uh, burgers, cutlets, pizza, et cetera. Uh, they are available. And uh, they have shelf life from six months to one year. Uh, and uh, dried mushrooms can be used in variety of preparations like soup, sausages, et cetera. Uh, besides, mushrooms are recommended as functional foods because of the presence of bioactive compounds like beta-glucans in them. So due to their immunomodulatory properties, uh, these beta-glucans have been used for combination of therapy. The presence of high proteins, sterols, etc., are ideal for prevention of cardio cardiovascular diseases like that. Uh, these are important uh, dietary supplements which are being recommended. These are the mushrooms. These are the mushroom product names. And these are the brand names under which they are available in the market. And they are being used as immunity booster as, uh, for balancing the stress and energy support, etc. For all these brain and nervous system support, these mushrooms, their products are available under different brand names in the, in the market. Besides this, dried and dehydrated edible mushrooms are also available in the market with shelf life extending from six months to one year. And you can see the market price of these dried from rupees 1500 in case of pleurotus to 40,000 in case of morels. You can see the range, the, the, and they are being collected from the wild. They are not cultivated. With We all know them and their shelf life also extends from six months to three years here and the market price from 150 to approximately rupees 700 that is there. Canned mushroom and frozen mushrooms are also available and uh, their storage period extends up to two years and market price of canned white button from 200 to rupees 400 and from paddy straw from 400 to 700 oyster, shiitake, et cetera. They are also other options which are available and freezing is one of the best options for preserving these uh, mushrooms and their natural taste. These are the products available in the market uh, as far as mushrooms are concerned. Besides, there are cosmetic products being prepared from different species of mushrooms, lentinula, idotes, canoderma, lucidum, cordyceps, schizophilum, all sorts of applications are there as far as these mushrooms are concerned. Besides, you have mycofiltration. They can be used as mycofilters for filtering the sewage, sewage water. And uh, the mushroom can all be used to filter agriculture runoff uh, so as to clear them from contaminants. Microremediation in other aspects, they uh, have capability to produce extracellular enzyme, uh, which can degrade lignin, which can degrade cellulose, and because of their capability, they are able, capable of digesting the uh, agro waste. And, and uh, there are a lot of other advantages. They can work, they can degrade oil spills also. This, this was one experiment by Washington State of Transport. Uh, where the soil was blackened with oil and rick with aromatic hydrocarbons and one such brum. And it was subsequently analyzed that 95% of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons were destroyed and reduced to non-toxic components. And the mushrooms were also free of any petroleum products. You can see this was the brum where pleurotus was, uh, seed was planted and you can see the fruiting bodies here subsequently. And then they have also reported to be capable of targeting even the nerve gas, a toxin that takes hundreds of years to break down uh, of its own. Even uh, there are a number of other aspects, bioremediation, where we have species of phenarochete with its capability to produce uh, these enzymes, like as polyphenol oxidase, lignin peroxidase. They can degrade toxic xenobiotics. Phenarochete, flavido, alba uh, produces manganese peroxidase, uh, which helps in uh, removing the, uh, you can say, dye uh, pollutants. Trematis versi color, although it is medicinal because of its lignolytic enzyme production, it is used as biocatalyst for decolorization of different industrial dyes and waste water treatment. Pleurotus ostiatus is capable of degrading polycyclic 
aromatic hydrocarbons. Even pleurotus pulmonary areas, it is an edible mushroom and uh, it's significant in decreasing the copper, manganese, nickel, polyaromatic hydrocarbon from the soil. It helps in bioremediation. Lantinus tuber regium, another edible mushroom and medicinal mushroom, uh, it is also important for amelioration of crude oil polluted soils. Pleurotus. Uh, like that Lantinus querosulus is capable of degrading the- Sir, your time is over. From the soil. Yeah. Yes, sir. Lantindola, uh, roots, et cetera. And these are the heavy metals which, which are reported to be remediated by these mushrooms. And <clears throat> so they are highly referred as special creation of God due to multifarious advantages we draw directly from them and many of them, uh, we know we need to investigate them. We need to we can say conserve them and we need to analyze them and we need to, uh, you can say, uh, popularize them. That is what is required. A lot of mushrooms requires uh, conservation for the purpose of domestication. So we have to understand their uh, role and we have to popularize them. He is the teacher, Professor Sassani, with whom I worked, I learned mushroom and I uh, reached to the level where I am today. They are my students and uh, the department at Punjabi University Patella to which I owe uh, everything, whatever I have learned as far as mushrooms are concerned. Thank you very much. This is Punjabi University Patiala, Guru Gobind Singh Bhavan, where there are, these are four, five religions and all have a single goal. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Atri, for a illustrative presentation. We have next speaker is Professor Sadawa from Philippine University. Uh, sir, sir, Deshmukh, sir. Haji. If you allow uh, uh, Dr. Ru is with us for a moment, can we okay. have a brief discussion? If, he, yeah, if you okay, no problem. If you permit, sir. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Ru. I am still here. Hmm. Thank you. You are there, sir? Yeah. Y yes, indeed. Uh, I am still here. Dr. Ru, it was really an eye-opener talk for many of us. Uh, th there was one query, uh, but do we have the same possibility even if we have a coniferous forest since uh, in your case you have uh, expressed some of the broad-leaved uh, uh, these species, what about the coniferous uh, forest? Indeed, um, in, in fact, the theory, uh, this uh, foraging ascomycete hypothesis was was first proposed for coniferous forests. Um, I think the, the important aspect um, is that the, the, the leaves are not annually deciduous. Yeah. And so coniferous forests fit this really well. Uh, we've actually, we have studied uh, this ecological um, habit in coniferous forests in the Pacific Northwest of the United States as well. Uh, and, and we do find evidence for it as well in these cases. Um, and, 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 you know, and do we have the same kind of possibility in case of polypores and corticoids because they even grow up to the bark or stem right on the standing trees? Yeah, well, you know, polypores are a really interesting, um, uh, an interesting case because they, they produce an, uh, honestly just an absurd number of spores. Yeah. Um, and so polypore dispersal is, um, is something, there, there has been a lot of work done on polypore dispersal and certainly direct spore dispersal is the primary mode of dispersal for uh, polypores. But uh, polyporalian basidiomycetes are commonly found as endophytes. Um, and and I, I think that the best explanation um, is this, um, it's it, primarily as a way to provide persistence in the environment. Um, so that, you know, if there is a period, you know, the spores, they produce an incredibly large number of spores, um, but there are still certainly periods where the spore density drops to almost nothing when um, fruiting conditions for the fungi um, are, are bad, right? Um, and so, you know, how do you restart uh, a population of this kind of fungi 
when um you know if there is like a long drought and you know there are no there's no possibility for the fungi to be fruiting um and you know a reservoir of the organism within the leaves in the canopy uh is you know a really uh, it's a really smart thing for the fungi to do yeah because uh, uh, taking a clue from your presentation even during our explorations of northwestern himalaya we have noticed sometimes that a particular species is dominating a particular locality. You find in that locality, uh, the others one, they are usually absent or relatively much lesser in number. So this, this might mm -hmm. be some, some, something to do with that also. Xyleria, Xyleria, yeah. we yeah. have collected from Chakrata, we have collected from Manali in the coniferous forest. They are available in the coniferous forest. I have, yep. I have collected. Yeah. Chakrata, Deoban, I have collected. I have collected from Manali uh, three, four times. They are available in the yeah. This is. There is no problem. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. This is. This is part of why the diversity. There are, you know, the the majority of Xylaria, I think, prefer uh, hardwoods. Um, they prefer these, you know, the angiosperm lineages. Uh, but there are definitely Xylaria species um, that that not only prefer um, coniferous wood, uh, but there are also generalist species that can grow on, on both coniferous and angiosperm wood. Uh, so there's yeah, no, it's not a. It's, I think the diversity might be lower in coniferous forests in general. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but, you don't find that much, but you do get uh, definitely. You do get. The basic yeah. idea of his presentation was to work on cloud forest in India because I see some cloud forest in the Western Ghat as well as Northeast. So to encourage the people yes. to work on cloud forest, that was the, my the idea. And the basic thing that people to encourage to work on this field and may have the collaborative work with him. Yes. Sir, sir, taking a clue, this, this has the very first thing which strikes to my mind that why not to plan it as far as uh, the studio and I, I had a chat and uh, it was really a, a lead, important lead to work in this direction. Thank you very much, Dr. Ru. It was an excellent talk. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. I, so we I, I must apologize. Next. I, I will. I think I will. After after this, I will need to um, duck out. It is it is midnight here. Midnight, yeah. <laughs> thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank this has been guys. wonderful. Yeah. So, coming to the last presentation of this session, we have Professor Sadaba from Philippine University. He is a he is working on mostly on the fungal diversity of mangrove acidic sponges, fungal community in the bunker, sea oil spill sites, and other aspects of degradation of the various pollutants. Not taking much time, I will request him to start his presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ecological Society of India, for inviting me uh, to be part of this uh, annual gathering. So the presentation I have this morning is about the relationship of fungi with the oil spill. Now, um, the talk basically will cover the following topics about the background, about the oil spill, and about the oil itself, and on the various experiments that we have done in terms of enumeration of fungi from oil spill areas, the biosimulation experiments, degradation of the total petroleum by hydrocarbon by fungal consortia and the basidium acids by the graders of the polar aromatic hydrocarbon. Now we know for a fact now the Philippines is an archipelago and much elsewhere the marine environment is subject to contamination by organic pollutants from a variety of sources and mostly coming also from domestic and uh, industrial. Now it, According to ITOF in 2015, 1.3 million tons of oil entered the marine environment and um, it's a result primarily of the spill. And every spill is quite different in terms of the amount and type of oil and also on the physical and chemical characteristics of the oil as well as the prevailing climatic conditions of the sea and whether the oil remains at sea or as it was. In fact, these things here are very important in determining the initial response in solving an oil spill. Now, this is a picture showing you the spill due to the breaking of the Tasman spirit just off the coast of Pakistan in 2003, releasing this volume of crude oil. 
Now, one of the most, the largest oil spills of, uh, we had uh, is the prestige that uh, was a result of the sinking of the uh, prestige uh, tanker that released more than 60,000 oil of uh, heavy fuel oil that contaminated 3,000 kilometers from ground zero, covering France that of Portugal, in fact, covering the entire shoreline. Now, recently last year, we had this spill in Mauritius due also to the grounding of Wakashu. Uh, that was July 25, 2020. And um, the spill actually uh, occurred in a very environmentally critical area, uh, which is near a marine wetland park. And uh, we know that Mauritius is also a tourist destination. And until now, they're still uh, solving the problem. Now in the Philippines, we have a lot of oil spills recently. Now, the very large spill, one of the largest spill was in this island in Antique in December 2005. Then the largest to date is the solar spill in Guimaras in near our area. I live somewhere here. And we have another spill in Cebu, one of the popular tourist destinations. Then we have also the, the spill here in northern Iloilo in the island of Panay. This is the island of Panay. Then we have the Sportivo oil spill. And recently, again, just two weeks before the spill in Mauritius, we had this another power barge uh, explosion that resulted to an oil spill near in the city itself. Now, this is a picture showing you the spiller. This is a power barge because for some time the Philippines has been dependent on these power barges, which are act like a uh, what you call this a, a portable generator that is brought to the different islands because of scarcity of fuel of electricity. And this is the damaged area, and this is how it looks on the ground. The water is basically full of oil. Now, the largest oil spill to date is the one due to the solar one oil spill in 2006. This is the ground zero. It affected all these red areas that landed in here. And we have our marine biological station in here. And it even reached this portion of the island of Panay. Now, this is one of the worst hit areas, the mangrove areas in there. That resulted in the mortality of the mangroves. Now, the spill that occurred in Cebu Island is a result of the collision between the tank, uh, the uh, this vessel and that of another passenger vessel. And it resulted in mortality also mangroves in here. And then in 2014, uh, when Typhoon Haiyan landed, this power barge was dislodged from here and it, it ran into the shoreline and it released a lot of oil into the area. What is sad is in here, we have a lot of people that has already been hit by Typhoon Haiyan. Now, so last year we had the spill, this is the culprit. So it also affected the mangrove area just across and these are in the, in the other island that affected it. Now, so crude oil is a number of oil. It's in this range of amount every year. And we know that the crude oil is composed of a complex mixture of hydrocarbons with alkanes, the cycloalkanes, the monoaromatic, and the PAH. Now, if you look further, petroleum oil contains these uh, chem chemicals, and it's a complex mixture of hydrocarbons. And the aromatics account for 1 to 20%, with the pH around 0.2 to 7%. Then we look also for the BTEX. Um, these are the pH, these are nonpolar, hydrophobic, organic compounds with two or more fused bands and ring. And they also have uh, some of these have the five member ring. And these are usually recalcitrant, just of their high molecular weights that are difficult to degrade. Now, what's the role of microorganisms and degradation? You know, for a fact that microbes are everywhere in all kinds of environments. They're capable, some of them have the ability to adjust to this uh, pollutants. And they develop this by doing a production of specific enzymes. And uh, they also have physiological responses that makes them uh, able to utilize the hydrocarbon as energy sources. And they are you know, efficient or potential uh, agents for bioremediation as uh, mentioned earlier also by uh, Professor Atri. Now, so fungi, uh, we know for a fact that according to Atlas, that classic paper, that there's always an increase in the uh, about 100% viral in oil uh, areas for this hydrocarbon utilizing microorganism. And fungi are cosmopolitan and they're able to grow in contaminated areas and convert the hydrocarbon into energy as a source of energy because they have this ability to produce the unspecific uh, enzymes that are involved in cellulose and lignin degradation. And uh, so an increase in the selected fungal population is better to metabolize these contaminants. So these oil spills, 
Okay? Except for the last one, have provided us with the opportunity to investigate what is the happening to the fungi in, during an oil spill. All right? So these are the results question that we pose. So one, what is or are the effect of fungal population in terms of species composition and load? How about, about uh, are if fungi effective degraders of hydrocarbon, in particular in the marine environment? And are the fungi able to produce the enzymes, particularly these uh, three groups of enzymes? Uh, with one uh, commonly look at into the LMEs or the lignin modifying enzymes. Then the question also on can we stimulate all right, this fungi to increase their ability to degrade the oil in the area? And lastly, uh, do we have other groups of fungi that can effectively degrade hydrocarbon in oil contaminated site? Now, so let's take a look at the first one. So, what's the effect? So, these are the publications, sorry. Um, these are the publications from which. Uh, this uh, part is uh, uh, derived from. All right, so in Guimaras Island, we did a rapid assessment during the 2006. Then a follow-up study was done in 2009 to take a look at the temporal assessment after three years. Then we also had a rapid assessment done here in the Power Bars 104 in 2014. Now, okay, in terms of density, we can uh, clearly see here that, uh, sorry, what's this? Um, Okay, so we can see in here that the main fungal load is only significantly higher on mangrove soil and surface between the oil and the oil and the non oil, right? On the other types in 2006 samples. Now, uh, overall, we had about 26 species, majority of course are microsporic, and uh, this is the species composition. Now, if then we uh, uh, classify them, so we have this five, five species Aspergillus, yeast, Mycelia, Cerilia than the common genera of the penicillium and aspergillus. Now, so the results in 2000 sales for the, mini, um, the main fungal load was only significantly higher on surface mangrove oil between the oil and the unoiled, but not with other sample types. Now, uh, in general also, the majority are microsporic, but species composition varied from site per sample. Now, if you compare now the, the assessment after three years, now we can see here that um, there is an increase from the 2006 data, this one here, and the 2009. So there was an increase in the fungal load in the surface beach water. Same was observed for the beach soil. And using this time, take note where you're only using the PDA as a general medium. Now, the same thing is observed with that of the mango surface oil in 2009, much higher than that of 2006. Now, for the mango subsurface soil, the same thing also, same trend. And uh, we also did a follow-up or uh, another study in 2014. At uh, this time, we added now the use of the Bushnell has, which is a selective medium for hydrocarbon degraders. And take note here that this relatively lower load compared to the general fungal population. But this is more selective to the hydrocarbon degraders. Now, so these are some of the species that we have uh, isolated. Okay, so we have all these species. So, so if we compare now the 2006 and 2009, we can see that there was a change in composition and density over a three-year period. And you know, we have 15 species now, which are hydrocarbon degraders, and 18 species in oil contaminated. But uh, we also saw aspergillus, but the different species that, again, may be attributed to lower concentration and the reduction or reduced toxicity of the oil. Now, the dominance of this microsporic fungi, although not of the same composition in both sides, may be a type of course their ubiquity or members of the original microflora. And the, however, the increase in fungal density was quite pronounced in the 2000 data compared to 2006. Now, in addition to that, um, the increase in this density clearly indicates, in a way, a recovery or the reestablishment of the normal flora among the oil contaminated sites in Guimaras Island. And uh, this speculation is further strengthened by the apparent changes in fungal species composition in the density noted at oil contaminated site. Now, this study, the third, second study, provided us with some information on how fungi respond over long term uh, to oil spills in a tropical setting. Now, unfortunately, uh, we, we don't have much of, we don't have a lot of papers to make comparison only few people, in fact, I think uh, nobody has done a survey similar to what we have done. So uh, this is just a baseline information. All right. Then 
the, we also had this in the 2014, another spill. So opportunity again. So this time uh, we have already the addition of the Bushnell has again, a selective medium for hydrocarbon. So uh, we use also PDA for the general microflora, but the results again show the similar group are dominating. Well, obviously it's also related to the procedure upon which we use, all right? Now, so um, interestingly, Aspergillus fumigatus was the most persistent and uh, the PDA contained higher composition in load than the BH, while the beach area has higher composition from the load than the mangrove. Uh, and the mangrove area in this particular site have very low species diversity. In fact, it's almost more than specific. Okay, now if we compare further now, uh, the three data set, clearly we can say that um, we can see that the total number of collected in Iloilo is only 20 compared with this much higher species compared in the 2006 in Guimaras Island of 2006 and 2009. Now, however, the low number here could be partly attributed to the lesser number of the sampling size. We only have two sampling sites here. However, uh, what is interesting is the fact that the same genera are appearing. All right, so the dominant genera belongs to Aspergillus and the penicillium. Again, also reported elsewhere. And uh, the species contaminate, uh, okay, those species that uh, we encounter in the oil contaminants in 2006 were presumed to be hydrocarbon degraders. So uh, because of this, um, they have obviously uh, presumed also have the ability to secrete the enzyme that can degrade hydrocarbons and also use the hydrocarbon resource for energy. And in addition, they have the capability to tolerate high toxicity, allowing them to survive in freshly oiled sites. All right. Now, however, um, their absence in 2009 now could be a result of competition from the non-oil degraders resulting from the reduction of oil present in the site. Okay. Now, so the reduction in oil concentration in Guimaras Island in 2009 led to a possible shift in the flora and the reappearance of the normal microflora. Implication, possible recovery of these habitats. Now, there are factors that influence the observed changes in terms of fossil composition. So these are the different factors that could have contributed to the observed change over time. Now, so the common species, however, that existed in three different types of collection include the same genera, all right, of uh, the species. Um, so the next question now, so are they effective degraders, all right? So since we have already tried to isolate them, so we tried to explore on their ability to degrade um, the total petroleum hydrocarbon, either singly, in pair, or three, in a fungal consortia. Okay, so, so we screened them using the Bushnell has so supplemented with the sterile crude oil as a solo carbon source. They evaluated them in terms of their ability to degrade TPH, the pH, and the alkanes using the GCMS. All right, so this is the procedure, very simple, straightforward. Then um, if, if you look at the degradation of the total petroleum marital in the pre-screening, uh, we can see here that the uh, Spergillus Niger uh, rank number one, uh, we only had two, uh, a, seven, a 14 day experiment trial. So we have a Spergillus Niger here at 40%, almost 50%. Well, day 14, however, it was not penicillium, but still uh, this particular species or isolate still rank number 10. Now, so for the PAs also, uh, we have same species, number one, then also for the day 14. Now, um, so we rank all the top five species and we selected this one so that this becomes now our basis for, their, um, for the further experiment on the degradation. So we use this uh, isolate here and here. Now, so this is, uh, we had a 14 day uh, uh, experiment. So this is the day zero, day seven, and this is 14. Uh, the culture is in um, static, it's not uh, in, a rot in rotating or in a shaker. So it's a 14 day period only. Now, for the degradation, Aspergillus fumigatus uh, was the uh, highest in, uh, individually. Then uh, Asperg uh, penicillium took over after the 15, uh, 14 days. For the total, uh, for the period, we have combination of C, Aspergillus uh, niger, plus the Pisillomyces, and then uh, rank number one here, and uh, 
for the uh, day 14, it was a same aspergillus fumigatus plus in addition with that of pesulomyces uh, at 69, almost 70%. Now, for the three species, we had a better, uh, we have here uh, this combination of A and B, then that of pesulomyces again. All right. Now, so if you compare, if you analyze further here, the, if you look at the average degradation of the total petroleum hydrocarbon compared with individual, uh, they uh, day 14, uh, 7, day 7 here, day 7, then uh, day 14, must be higher. So we can see here that the individual activity here appears more effective in terms of the degradation of the total petroleum hydrocarbon. I'm not showing any more the GS uh, figures. All right. Now, in terms of the degradation of the pH, it's again, uh, for individual, it's the uh, aspergillus fumigatus followed by the penicillium on day 14. Uh, 16 point, but this one is much higher, 43%. Now, for the paired species, we have uh, CND, uh, Spergillus zinger, and then we have your uh at 34%, yeah, while the AND had a 65.9 on day 14. Now, so three species, it's a different uh, story, uh, much higher with this combination. And if you look at now the summary of this in terms of the uh, degradation of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. Here we can see that, uh, in a way, that the consortia appear to be more effective. Is this now synergistic action? Is this what's happening now in the field? Okay. So we look also on the degradation of the alkanes. So again, for individual, is the result. Uh, uh, sorry. For the uh, day 14, is much higher. Then for the uh, pear species, we have relatively high, but a reduction in uh, uh, day 14. We don't know really what happened in there. Then on the, uh, for the three species combination, we can see that CDNE had higher, but again, relatively uh, lower on the day 14. So there seems to be a reduction in the degradation on day 14. Now, so again, if you look at the summary in here, we can see that the individual appears, again, more effective, similar to the degradation of the PAs, individual activity. Uh, now, so if you look further now into the degradation of the TPAs and the PAs by individual, this particular isolate uh, rank highest with 64% for the total petroleum and 43% reduction for the PAs. Now, for the pair species, Consortium, uh, these are the more effective at, at the highest values of 69% and 66.59 with an increase of efficacy of 13.61 and 42%. Now, for the three species consortium, we have the species. Do this left for you. This. Okay, the yeah. total petroleum degradation is 67, PA 66.9. All right, so for alkane degradation, individual almost similar. All right. Okay, groups of species. So this particular study has demonstrated the hydrocarbon biodegradation potential of these tropical fungi from oil-contaminated habitats. Now, the, we check further under ability now to why they're able to do that. But we look into the qualitative enzyme assays, the LME. So we know already that. All right. So this is the result. So very strong, weak, and no result. So the overall showed that the most as well as produced the LME peroxidase that explains their ability to um, grow and degrade the hydrocarbon. And also, we do the CMB assay. Again, most have a positive result. The same that. Then we also tested for the XBM assay. And uh, uh, although not uh, only 63 out of the 157 showed good results, but still, uh, it's very important. So this is how it looks when you have the degradation. Hello. All right. Okay, so the last one will be what? Can we stimulate by this time? Uh, we, we know for a fact that bioremediation is very, you know, the always say bioremediation, but usually bioremediation is only uh, done in the last phases, in the, uh, even in waste management. So we define this as the technique, either, you know, using the natural process or stimulation, either addition of nutrients or microorganisms. So we opted for this. However, we know that in marine environment, we can only apply bioremediation only at the shoreline, high, medium, and low tide. Now, 
uh, divary and technique ex situ, but take note that bio augmentation is not considered because it is not effective in field studies at all. So we opted for bio in, in situ biostimulation, and this time we use the nutrient content. So we use the addition of uh, uh, fertilizer because experimental studies have shown that they're able to do that. So we want to see if this applies in the field. Uh, however, I would like to say that bioremediation through biosimulation takes time. It is only used as a polishing technique. You cannot do this once you have a large volume of oil. Okay, you have to remove all the other oils. Then you will have your uh, bioremediation. Now, so we, we tested for the application of osmocote to stimulate. All right. So the results show that there is an increase in the, in the either on the PDA and even the uh, bush cell has. There is an increase in the uh, fungal load when there is an addition of fertilizer. But if you look at the areas with no fertilizer, there's no much of change. Uh, either whatever what site you have in uh, the study was only for 20 day period. It's almost the same trend. Now, uh, overall, overall, you can see that there's an increase in the fungal load where we have an addition of the fertilizer, but not in areas without fertilizer. The species composition, uh, the number is here. So you have uh, more species, but relative, again, these are the um, selective for the hydrocarbon degraders. So in terms of composition, that's how the data will show. And these are the species that were said to be a potential uh, degraders. Now, so most species collected uh, from samples augmented with fertilizer with PDA, uh, particular in the mangrove area, um, uh, clearly shows an increase in the biosimulation effect of the osmocote, a slow release fertilizer, but they vary post. Now, in general, the fertilizing seemingly stimulates fungal population, both the hydrogram degraders and the non. However, the density was fluctuating also during the 2080 period. Now, um, there are other groups now, question, that are able to degrade. So again, as mentioned, as a, as a follow-up, it's a very good segue to the uh, presentation by uh, Professor Atre. Now we use bio, bio basidiomycetes as biodegraders of the PAH. So, uh, so we know already that this one, right? So, so we know that fungi, particularly the basidiomycetes, can make use of the hydrocarbon as their energy source that makes them efficient degraders of uh, high molecular weight pH. So we know that there's ability because of the uh, ability for extracellular oxidation and the, the target group would be the white rot fungi because of the ability to produce the oxidative. So these are the white rot fungi already mentioned uh, earlier. So these are some of those genus or genera that have shown to have this ability. Uh, this are this a list of uh, other fungi or mushrooms that are have already been tested, um, but not yet in the field really. So we know that though we make use of their ability to do the production of these three groups of uh, enzymes necessary for the complete degradation of your um, uh, the polyaromatic hydrocarbon. So they must have the presence of this enzyme. So the challenge, however, is that uh, most of this will be done in the lab. Although uh, Dr. Atri has uh, shown the work of Paul Stamets there in the field, but uh, that is something that needs to be further investigated. And of course, the potential is really great for that. All right. Now, the, so we need really more investigation. And this, this is now the direction we are working into. So we're we'll evaluating different species of the basidiomyces, in particular, uh, the polypores, because they have this really great potential. So we know that uh, we need more studies in analytical chem, even genetic engineering, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can really have increased fungal efficiency in degrading hydrocarbons in other recalcitrant contaminants. So in summary, uh, we can see here that we have seen the relationship of fungi once there's an oil spill that uh, because they have this ability to produce the necessary enzyme, either singly or in consortia, in reality, in the field, they're always in consortia, all right? And so many species are producing different kinds of enzymes and acting in consortium. So because of this, they are uh, able to degrade the hydrocarbon. And because of that, it influences also the fungal population and load in a particular affected site. And then we also explored if we could possibly uh, take up by the way, of course, the group that we're showing here are mitosporic. They could either be part of the uh, anascomycete or basidiomycete. And uh, we explored also the possibility of stimulating them by the addition of fertilizer and see that there is always there's a good um, potential also. But uh, we have to do additional uh, extended studies because of our limited uh, 
test only. Then, of course, now the potential for the use of the white rat lucidimides as agents for uh, what we call X C2, not in C2 bioremediation. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that uh, I'm able to share something for the group. Thank you. Dr. Sadapa, you have given a very nice uh, talk on this aspect. Your talk is very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it is very interesting. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Now uh, we are closing the session. Now uh, I would like to see a session. Excuse me. Uh, just before clo uh, closing this session, I would like to thank uh, I thank Dr. Deshmukh and Dr. K. Malavijai for chairing this session and successfully complete, completion it in scheduled time. I am also grateful to Professor Roo van der Grape from University of Oregon for delivering a very very beautiful and fascinating talk on distribution of various members of gyllarials in tropical cloud forest. Uh, I am grateful to my teacher and man of mushroom, Professor Atri, for sharing their views on the incredible service of mushroom in human life, as well as their role in ecosystem replenishment understanding biodiversity improvement and seed link germination is especially in salt forest, metal bio, uh, metal pollutions, bioconversion of waste material by mushroom, as well as sources of revenue and their role in medicine, as well as in food. So I thanks all the delegates, especially youngsters, that will get benefit from this lecture. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for sparing time to be with us for this beautiful talk. Uh, the, I am also uh, thank, uh, grateful to Professor Sadaba from Philippines for sharing their knowledge on the topic fungi and oil spills in Philippines. Professor Staba explained in a very nice manner various sources of oil spills in islands of Philippines and their compositions, as well as the role of the various microbes, especially the fungi in bioremediation uh, of the oil. Professor Rabada discussed here in details about various species of the fungi, their role in uh, the remediation of uh, these oil spells. The lecture was very much inspiring and the young mycologist will get uh, many new clues in this line of research in the future. Once again, I thank all the speakers, chairman and co-chairman, as well as all the uh, participants who joined online with us. So thank you very much uh, for this. So once again, I thank Dr. Avneet for giving me the chance to moderate this session of the second day of the conference. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Avneet Paul. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, for uh, uh, nicely conducting the session in time, and Dr. Malarbidi also, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor D.P. Singh for a good moderation. Thank you very much. Doctor, 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 nice uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Malarvizi was uh, to share with us the chairperson's remarks. Kindly go ahead with that so that we can formally close this session. Okay. Actually, uh, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. I don't want to take much time. At, uh, uh, I think I'm having a net, network issue. Oh, can you hear me all? Yes, yeah, ma'am, you are audible. Okay, I would like to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we have started this session uh, on time. We could be able to finish this uh, three uh, sessions, where as uh, the moderator has said,
the first session was about the uh, professor ke, Ruh, 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 Ruh. and professor Ru who has took, uh, took us to ecuador and he has just delivered a wonderful lecture on this uh, spatial distribution of uh, xyleria and followed by dr uh, professor atri our uh, he has given a comprehensive account of various uh, higher fungi and their ethnomycological uh, aspect, how this uh, fungi has been explored in the tribal community. Still, we have to bring all those uh, et uh, ethnomycologically important fungus in culture. And thanks for the wonderful uh, presentation, sir. And the last and the most uh, important and very exciting presentation is about the uh, fungal flora from the oil spilling uh, contaminant areas. So he has given a, a very good account on the how this uh, mitosporic fungi has been uh, dominating in the uh, uh, oil spill uh, areas. And likewise, how this uh, contamination can be, uh, is, uh, how this fungi are degrading the various uh, polyhydrocarbons and the possible role of the white rot, uh, white rot fungi in the uh, degradation of the polyhydrocarbon. Here, all the three lectures were very uh, interesting and it is mind blowing. I think it would give us a, a good path to the young mycologists. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank, so thank you very much. With this, uh, we come to the end of uh, first session of uh, today and we are extremely thankful to the honorable chairperson dr deshmukh and uh, co chairperson dr malar Vizi, for their valuable time uh, the next session is uh, scheduled at 11:30 uh, uh, i think let's take a quick break of 10 or 15 minutes then uh, we can start again inform the uh, chairperson and co chairperson yes sir i am already there sir okay madam the Honorable, Honorable President is already with us. Let Dr. Savita I'm already join. there. Good morning. Good morning, all of you. I am already there. Dr. Savita. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. So, chair and co-chair both are with us. We can have a quick tea break of 15 minutes. Then yes. we can reassemble at 10, 20, 11.20 so that we can start with the introduction portion and at 11.30 we can start with the first presentation by Professor Manurachari. Thank of you very course. much. Let's have a break of uh, 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good morning, Professor Raman. Hello. Sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, morning sir. Professor Rupam Ji, Professor Raman, and yeah. Professor Savita. Sir. So we are having a, a, a short break, sir. Yeah, yeah, I know. Then we will reassemble, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We are uh, already there in the for your lecture. We are uh, eager to hear your lecture. Wow, what eagerness, sir? We are old people. No, mm. it is this time. It is a uh, different. It is. Uh, sir, namaskar, sir. Uh, namaskar, sir. Namaskar, <laughs> sir, Professor. But uh, namaskar, uh, sir. Now you are fresh again. Huh? <laughs> no. uh, good, good. I am nice. here. Yes. Nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you. No, no it's my pleasure. Yeah. Namaskaram, then, sir. Namaste, Namaste, madam. Namaste. Namaste. How is your health, sir? Yeah, everything is fine, madam. Okay, yeah. sir. Happy to see you. Uh, thank you. How we are, are very children? happy to see you. Thank you. Thank you. How about the children? Yes, everybody is fine. Mm, good. So now you, your ch children are they are grown up and they are settled sir? and. Uh, huh? Sir, actually, I'm not married. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, no issue, sir. No issue. <laughs> no issues at all. <laughs> it's fine. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Ah, good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Savita, madam. 
Good morning, sir. Hope you are very fine. Good morning, good morning, sir. Uh, Jai Ram. Uh, Savita, very nice seeing you. Oh, yeah, how yesterday, are you? I, yesterday I missed your talk because we had some uh, MSc students. It was an excellent talk. We really there. enjoyed listening to Dr. Bhatt. And I no, no, it's my pleasure, Mr. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I just okay, wanted to tell. See what happens is. Uh, if there are some young people are hearing, I wanted to tell them that morphology also is equally important. Yes, because, yes. You see, what happens, I, I have noticed that most of these people from Thailand, Myanmar, China, they keep sending the, their descriptions and uh, illustrations. Sir, can you just help us to identify? So I was, I'm just wondering, how come only people cry for, okay, molecular, Sequence alone will do. It's not true. It's only morpho-molecular taxonomy. Eventually, it, it helps to. us to a stable taxonomy. No, so, Professor, but actually, uh, by seeing the person, uh, they say that one can judge. Morpho taxonomy is important. Yes. And then, see, everybody will not give DNA. Na? So DNA analysis come, comes later. The first thing is your observation. Yes. The first thing yes. is to settle down the issue on the basis of Marfa taxonomy. If you are unable to say that who child is this or that, then DNA uh, will be giving you the things. So, no, sir. Sir, sir, I would, I would say that all these things should go together because these are the modern tools available and we should certainly take and our students also should take this kind of approach because morphology alone in the you know it's not it will not um, really make a sense in the time in the in future times but all these things should go together uh, yeah no, that is molecular, uh, sir. molecular alone will also not lead us anywhere sometimes uh, the data obtained is so misleading well, it's okay. Culture yes. and uh, non culturable fungi and cryptic Correct. species segregation is uh, possible because of molecular uh, uh, tools. Now, that is the recent uh, one which has to be adopted. No doubt, yes. about, no doubt about that. Uh, let us see how best these youngsters will cooperate because now everybody, <laughs> is, running, everybody is running after money, and uh, wherever they get money, they will go. I, I don't know whether. Whether Marfa taxonomy is important or molecular taxonomy is important or earning money is important or uh, uh, whatever it is, I don't know the future of the children and future yeah, of yeah. youngsters. It is all in the fluid state. Future yeah. of youngsters is in fluid Sir, state. Sir, uh, ma'am, you see, your ram uh, fungi, it's yeah, eventually molecular biology which will help, you know, molecular sequence data. Yeah. So, VAM especially. Yes. yes. The difficulty with the VAM fungi is uh, that there is no perfect stage. Yes. And then if you, even if you want to put it, earlier it was in zygomycotina. Uh, of course, now they say that it is uh, glamoromycota and all that. Yes. Uh, yes still, yes. still, I am not uh, satisfied with that kind of classification. There are two groups of uh, taxonomists who will be fighting for this. Uh, uh, my, uh, the mycorrhizal fungal taxonomy, still they have not settled their uh, uh, disputes. And uh, Walker and Redeker on one side, right. the other person is on the other mm, side. Yes, 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 correct. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, at least I, I can uh, say that uh, one of my new species that I discovered is um, based on molecular taxonomy, I could say that this is a new taxa. Otherwise, it could not have been possible. That was, all, that was helpful to me. In many ways, uh, that is the uh, glamorous Hyderabadensis, which we yeah. have discussed the first time. Sir, uh, and we sequence, are the no, no, sequence yeah. analysis finally helps us to get no, the that confirmation. Is simple, that is simple yeah. one, ITS we did, and yes. uh, that way that has helped. And we are the fair first, enough. Yes, uh, we are the first uh, people in India to come out with three new taxa in uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Oh, and okay. uh, uh, that is the, for the first time we, we have come out. So, Akalospora terricola, I... an, another one, and Glamus indica. This is the three new species. I, I had two. Yeah, I had two letters yesterday night. One from 
professor uh, young sishir vasan you know or, <laughs> then professor b n jori yesterday night yeah uh, they they saw what i spoke and uh, they are very great teachers and i was very happy to listen from them you know yesterday night and uh, no no okay. sir But, i i want to tell you you wrote that no, no, sir. four words no, no, no. you know? they are great teachers but uh, bn um, jory was a mic is a microbiologist but still sir he did uh, good work he did, work, on he fungi, did yeah. work in uh, yes. thermo thermophilic fungi thermophilic fungi i can yes. agree and yes. then sir yes. srinivasan is uh, is also biochemist and microbiologist so but he did a uh, lot of work on that one fungus sir yeah that you is the mind hydro i think he looked further yeah Anyway, thank you, sir. Nice conversation, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. uh, Rupam Kapoor, you, you you did a beautiful job yesterday. Wonderful lecture, I yeah. heard from you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Yesterday's proceedings were really good. I yeah, very good. sat whole day. Yeah. Now we have excellent lectures now also. Yes. Today also, yeah, we have. Morning, Even after school, we have yes. good lecture. Yes. Excellent, sir. But you should. All of you should excuse me that I will be available only for my lecture only. Oh, sure, sure. The, otherwise, fine, I'm a little bit busy with sure, other sure. things. Take care, yes, sir. So we have to. Savita, how are you doing? I am fine, sir. After a long time, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> nice sir. seeing you. Yeah. Um, We see with the admission process and the things yeah. like that. Uh, all. Um, I am, uh, Madam uh, Rupam Kapoor. See, I am. I was uh, somewhere in the middle of Professor C V S students. Sabita, last student. Last of student. Professor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, one new observation that I made is yesterday. I forgot to tell you, Professor. Uh. But see, Ravindranath Tagore was the eleventh child, uh. and uh, you are the fifth <laughs> child among the eleventh one. So yes, if, yes, there yes. 11, if there are eleven, if there are eleven children, I think most of them will be very ge genius people, no? Is it so? Uh, Illuminate. No, no. I just made those observations because my father and mother they inspired me to, you know, the formal education they had they were not having, but they did a great deal of. Um, yeah. Those I'm days, seeing, those were. I'm, I'm seeing Dr. Maravaji after a long time. Yeah, and Thank many you. others. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's a good opportunity for us to see each other and talk. Mm. Thank you, sir. Mm. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So I will again mute both my things. Yes. Good morning, sir. Ah, uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. How do you do? Yeah. Good morning, sir. Ah, good morning, sir. Good morning. So, things are okay, sir. Shana, yes. sir. Sharma, sir. Ah, sir. Sir, badiya hai. I'm normal. Yeah. Abhi, how are you? Ah, just badiya hu. Badiya hai. Kal bahut acha lecture tha. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, Manohar Chari, sir. Ah, good morning. Namaskar, madam. Namaskar, how are you? I am fine, sir. Good to see yeah. you. So, hail and hearty. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you. Sashreka, yes, how sir. are you? I am fine, I am fine. <laughs> But uh, Sashreka has arranged one of my lectures on webinar. Yes, yes, yes. She is doing you. excellent job, sir. Yeah, yes. but uh, yes. thank you so much. Deshmo, Deshmo, and Sashreka, they are very active. Correct, yes. Very active. Very active. But why, ma'am? All con uh, webinars are arranged on Sunday. That uh, was <laughs> online. Online lectures are going on uh, simultaneously, so the teachers are not free to attend. No, so I had to make uh, yeah, some kind of. Yeah, sometimes miss such important lectures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But some we have been doing on uh, weekdays also, but uh, the teachers will not be able to attend. Then what's the point? You know, we need to uh, propagate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, working would not be able. Professor Rupan Kapoor, ma'am. Professor Rupan Kapoor will be busy on Sunday. Oh. Yes, <laughs> oh, yeah. the only day she gets all the laundry and everything. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. I know that uh, she 
नमस्ते 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 वेलकम सर 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 थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग आ गुड मॉर्निंग सविता मैम हाउ आर यू सो नाउ प्रोफेसर एशपाल शर्मा इज एडिटर इन चीफ मैं लग पाते यू विल ब्रिंग आउट ऑल क्वालिटी पेपर्स इनटू द इशू ऑफ कावाका होप सो या विल ट्राई सर विल नाउ यू टेक द पेपर फ्रॉम प्रोफेसर रूपम कपूर प्रेजेंटेशन एड्रेस सर आई हैव ओनली गॉट द सीएस she yeah. she already has sent me a very good paper sir yeah i know and uh, i'm sure that others would follow yeah. good just after this conference sir we will be there yeah thank you thank you namaskar manuchi good morning ma'am uh, good morning ma'am good morning so for this session good morning uh, for this session where we are going to have the presentations of uh, msi fellow awardees for 2020 <coughs> Uh, may I request Professor Manuji Kaur? She will be moderating for this session. Over to Professor Manuji Kaur Ji for further proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Abhinit. So for today's session uh, of the Fellow Awards, uh, it's a woman empowered uh, session because I'm moderating, and uh, with me in the chair is uh, uh, Professor Rupam Kapoor Ji, and uh, the co-chair is with. Uh, professor jay sabita so i think i need to give a brief introduction of uh, ma'am uh, rupam kapoor although she is a well known personality with us uh, a very dynamic leader she has led uh, msi last year with a great zest and zeal she is a mycologist with a fame and is uh, working in the area of specialization that is interaction of plants with pathogenic and symbiotic fungi and microbial biotechnology and recently she as she was saying yesterday she is endeavoring into the macro fungi uh, welcome ma'am to chair this session and the co chair is in, uh, is with uh, professor jay savita uh, she is from uh, bengaluru Uh, having over 22 years of research experience in the area of microbial technology which includes 14 years of teaching in the university and college level uh, and the subjects of micro microbial biochemistry and physiology microbial technology she has a great experience in research and has very good papers to her credit and a number of uh, um, research papers and research students uh, are working with her and uh, i met uh, ma'am jay savita for the first time in a conference in scotland that is the place where we met for the first time and we have had a very good uh, uh, after uh, and that we met in i think uh, bangalore when the msi was held there and uh, a very good uh, personality to interact with so over to you ma'am kapoor and uh, ma'am savita for the conduct of this uh, thank you good morning to all we have such distinguished speakers in this session and with me uh, professor j savita would be co-chairing and the first talk is from professor c manora chari manora chari sir like we lovingly call him is most respected and most loved person which you we all will agree in the fraternity of mycology as well as botany he is a father figure for us and sir when you fell ill we all prayed to almighty for your speedy recovery and we are really thankful to him and we pray almighty for your long and healthy life so that we have your continued guidance and love upon us we all know manora chari sir very well but for the youngsters to know his journey how he reached here i would like to say few words professor c manora chari is an educationist dedicated teacher committed researcher with academic excellence and dynamic administrator he received his bachelor's masters and phd degree from university of osmania hyderabad and pursued his postdoctoral research at uk usa and germany 
he holds an excellent research record and has carried out outstanding research in the field of biodiversity taxonomy conservation and biotechnology of medicinal plant of uh, fungi medicinal <laughs> plants biology <laughs> and plant protection utilized for rural development professor monorachari has more than 40 years of dedicated teaching as assistant professor associate professor professor emeritus professor during this period he has guided 46 students for phd and published over 425 research papers as an outstanding achievement as an outstanding achievement he has discovered and described 13 new genera sir probably this is not an updated version 20 new genera 20 new genera 20 new genera and 81 new species and more than 500 new additions to fungal family of India. So you really stand tall in the field of taxonomy. Besides, he also has authored and edited more than 25. Recently, he has again uh, published and edited book. It was a wonderful book. Professor Manora Chari has earned several national and state awards. E.K. Janki Amal National Award, Ministry of Environment and Forest, J.C. Bose Award by UGC, Birbal Sani Medal from Indian Botanical Society, Scientist Award by Government of Andhra, and the list goes on and on. And I would be exhausting the period of 30 minutes if I continue with the list. Right. Which Anurachari has been decorated with. In view of his outstanding contribution, various honors were also con conferred on him, namely, member RAC Birbal Sani Institute of Paleobotany, President Botany Section 89th Indian Science Congress, President Indian Phyto Phytopathological Society, President Indian Botanical Society, Member Management Committee NBAIM Mau, President Mycological Society, and the list goes on and on. Professor Manora Chari also possesses rich experience of 20 years of administration as head department of botany, chairman board of studies in botany, principal university college of science, dean, chairman, PG admissions. He has organized 12 national and two international seminars his research fundings and outcomes are cited and used in the field of mycology, plant pathology, fungal biotechnology, microbiology in various institutions. He is widely traveled and possess immense research outlook that is an asset to all the mycologists across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, a strong applause for Professor Monorachari, and I request him to please present his talk. So thank Madam, you very much. Madam, 20 please. minutes, please. Yeah, please screen. 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Yes, screen sir. is, a, screen is yes. visible? Screen? Yes, sir, it is. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, this is the talk. I, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Rupam Kapoor and um, Kaur Madam and Savita Madam and Professor Raman and all the organizers and every one of you for having given this <coughs> tiny fungus an opportunity. Now, I don't want to go into further details, but fungi are very important and they are the eukaryotic and heterotropic, osmotropic, holopathic to eukaryotic nature is the most important one. And most of the fungi, they possess chitin cell wall. Only Umaipota will have the cellulose cell wall. And cell wall composition forms an important parameter for the classification of fungi. And then the fungi are, uh, how old are these fungi is a very difficult question to be uh, uh, expressed, but fungi might have evolved 1.06 billion years or 760 million years ago. And uh, this is how um, the uh, the fossil evidence shows in the case of Rhinia chat and other things. The, the fungi are everywhere. They are cosmopolitan and ubiquitous and uh, in distribution. And you will find on living vascular plants and plant exudates, dead plant parts and other microbes as analogs and on vertebrates, non-vertebrates, water, soil, air, so on and so forth. So they are everywhere and these are the habitats where you will find in the case of rhizosphere also. And then 
fungal diversity deals with the variety of the life and variety of the genes, variety of uh, biochemical parameters and morphology, and as well as so many other parameters, reproduction, ecological niches, ecological behavior. And so these are the, some of the aspects to be dealt, and that is the variation among the ecosystems also. And uh, one, why one should estimate these fungi? Fungi are second spe species rich organisms after insects, and it is more challenging to complete the global inventory as compared to other organisms and such as plants. And fungi play a very key role in the oxygenation of the earth. And recently the paper has been published and without fungi and mycorrhiza, there could not have been any kind of uh, uh, flora on this particular globe and earth. A significant role in the ecosystem dynamics and as well as decomposers. Therefore, even dead body decomposition is incomplete without bacteria and fungi. There are a number of fungi whose individual role needs to be understood and still unknown. And Hawksworth gave an estimate of 1.5 million fungi. Later, Hawksworth and Hawking said that in 2017, it is 1.8 to 3.5 million fungi. But Wu et al. in recent paper of 2019, he, along with others, Stadler and others, he said that there must have been an estimate of 13 million fungi. And I don't know how many years it will take. By that time, we will not be there. And uh, maybe 13 million fungi is such a kind of wealth that we have got. And how much of biotechnology could have emerged from this particular estimate. But unfortunately, the, the, much of the discoveries uh, are not taking place with reference to the taxonomy systematics and evaluation of this fungal load that is there in different habitats. And 1,40,000 fungal species have been reported from all over the world. And that is against 13 million fungi, which belongs to around 6,000 genera. And in India, we, it has been estimated that it, there may be five to uh, 10 lakhs of fungi. And then 29,000 fungal species as on today, they are estimated, they are identified uh, uh, representing 2005 genera. So the above data clearly indicate that there is a need to take up in-depth uh, in -depth analysis of this particular group of uh, organisms. And uh, especially India is um, one third of global biodiversity is in India. Therefore, India needs a special attention. Now, this is the fungal genera that is 1,40,000 belong to 7,270 genera. 29,000 species in India, they belong to 2,080 genera. And you know uh, that uh, one has to go for the ecological areas, niches, and collect the material, and then afterwards identify the organism, morphotaxonomy, and as well as molecular taxonomy, and characterize them, and come to the data capture, and then output is the species identification, and so on and so forth. And uh, out of this particular 29,000 fungi, I think 32% uh, th of fungi have been described by late uh, C.V. Subramaniam, the dying of uh, Indian mycology. And then remaining fungi have been discovered, discovered by other uh, scientists, which I will come to later. And conservation of these fungi, both ex situ and in situ conservation is very important. And you know, lyophilization, freeze drying, mineralized storage, water storage, soil storage, silica gel storage, and deposition of cultures in national germplasm centers is very important. And then these are some of the national centers where you can see NBIM and as well as NFCC, Pune, and then microbial type culture collection, Chandigarh, and then ITCC. And unfortunately, only 7% of fungi have been cultured all over the world, and remaining 93% fungi needs to be cultured. We don't have cultures of any of these rust fungi, obligate parasitic fungi in any of these hunters, either in the world or in the case of country like India. And at Solan, they are, they are maintaining these rust fungi on some of the wheat varieties. It is an unfortunate situation that we, we are not focusing on the non-culturable fungi and whatever that is easy, that comes to us that we are taking to consideration and doing the work. This is a challenge before us. And in India, we have different climatic conditions, forest and soil types. And therefore, it may take more than 10,000 years to study the fungal wealth in this particular country. From the fungal estimate of India, as mentioned above, it is clear that around 5,000 years, at least minimum, that is the necessity to go for this in the 2 million or two lakh, 5 lakhs of fungi. Unfortunately, many of the taxons in the world, I, they, have, they have expired or some of them have become old and some of them uh, 
uh, they, some of the youngsters, they are not showing any interest in the taxonomy because they feel that it is taxing on them. And uh, without taxonomy, uh, there is no science at all. Taxonomy is the mother of all sciences. In India, from 1907 to 2010, many of the noted mythologists like Butler, C.V. Subramaniam, Mundukar, Saxena, Tandan, Tirmulacha, Das Gupta, Agnotrudu, Bilgrami, Bhargava, Mukherjee, Agarwal, Pavagi, Mehrotra, Natrajan, DJ Bhatt, Lodha, Lakanpal, and many others have contributed immensely for the growth of mycology in India and described many new genera and species. However, from 2012 onwards, mycologists got troubled due to specific conditions envisaged by fungal nomenclature Melbourne Court to deposit the type cultures and specimens in two places, and as well as the CBD, National Biodiversity Board, and as well as the CBD are uh, uh, they, are, they are not allowing us to have the access of foreign materials, nor they allow the foreigners to come into this particular country. So these rules stipulated by this needs a lot of uh, discussion and mycologists had looked into this particular one uh, situation also. This is clear that existing mycology had to bring this state of affairs to the scientific matter to the notice of these boards. Otherwise, the, our numerical data, biodiversity data, and discover of new genera and new species which are of biotechnology and importance will not take place in this particular country. Recently, Chinese people have visited Meghalaya and uh, some of the mycologists of uh, Meghalaya Institute and discovered a green light emitting mushroom, Rhoeridomyces, which is a bioluminescent one. I don't know how they have allowed when the National Biodiversity Board and CBD are not allowing ourselves to go outside and deposit them away that Chinese people have been allowed. Therefore, it is essential that the rules are to be relaxed. And further, China, Brazil, Thailand, some European country, USA, UK, and others are doing the justice by discovering a lot of new genera and new species. And the Asia Pacific region and India is, uh, though they, it has got one third of global biodiversity, much of the work has not been going on after 2015. And this is an unfortunate situation and taxonomy has got its own hierarchical system that I don't want to go into the details. Marfa taxonomy is important. A lot of things we have discussed about Marfa and ultra microscopy structures, cell wall composition, chemical profiling, scanning electron microscopy, computer assisted chemistry, immunological methods, enzymes, and then molecular techniques like GC, the molar ratios, DNA, DNA hybridization, nucleic acids, R, and then RFLP, PCR, REFAD, and barcoding, so on and so forth, also helpful in this particular fungal taxonomy. Carbon is the source of the growth medium and monoses are useful in yeast taxonomy. And uh, many people are describing this particular group of organisms. Unfortunately, much has not been done on yeast taxonomy mm -hmm. and uh, yeast biodiversity in India. And our sea, oceans have got around 200 species. So that is the estimate that they have made, 200 species which are of biotechnological importance and nothing has been done in this one. Secondary metabolites also play a very important role in the case of fungal taxonomy, like polyketides, terpenes, and taxomyces has given taxol, a wonderful anti-cancerous drug, the multi-billion dollar drug, which was the first drug and uh, biotechnology product in USA. And like that, we have a number of uh, organisms, number of fungi, which have the relevance towards biotechnological application. This is the taxonomy hierarchy. Now, classification is to be very simple and to be followed by the youngsters and as well as for the teachers. And one should not complicate the fun fungal nomenclature and also fungal classification. And this is the U mycota. Sabatora has proposed this. And then Basidia mycota, Asco mycota, Zygo mycota, and Chytridia mycota, U mycota. And Promista has got uh, this U mycota and hypochytridiomycetes like this. And uh, uh, we have to look into this particular group of organisms classification. And U mycota may become uh, another kingdom in due course of the time because of the molecular genetics that has been working out in this particular group by many. And Hibet et al. 2007 has given a classification based upon molecular taxonomy. And recently, uh, Leo Tedderson, 2018, he has a high level classification he has proposed, maybe around 16 to 20 phyla he has created. And then some important observations that I would like to make is, yeasts are neglected in India. There might be 200 species of each which are important in India, present in oceans, external fungi occurring in deserts and then hot springs and also other adverse conditions, inhospitable conditions, and needs to be looked into that 
because we need a lot of biotechnology products. $16 billion worth of biotechnology products are produced around the world from that of the fungi. And the people in India, they don't give much of the importance, neither policymakers, nor the biologists, not the um, industries, they give much of the importance to this group of organisms, but the whole world is behind the particular group of organisms. Mangrove fungi are also very important, which has been neglected by many, and the study of chytrids has been neglected in India. Most of the chytrids are parasites and algae. Pavige has done a lot of work, followed by uh, others. And then it does not mean that other fungi are neglected, but there is still hidden wealth of fungi, which needs to reach attention of their economic importance. Recently, people working in different natural uh, laboratories have reported uh, that uh, on mobile phones also, and Twitters also, there are, there are fungi which are present. Therefore, fungi are exemplary in their action. And they, as for coming to the red data book, we don't have any kind of red data book in India. ICN has reported 1,512 fungal species in the year 2016 and declining uh, the fungal species also they have reported. But in India, recently Dr. N.K. Harsh has been assigned by the Minister of Environment to go into this particular aspect. From the available legal data Tibet, Ophion participants, which have, we have got seven species in India, and this is called Desi Viagra, it's also useful as anti-cancer drug. It is a well-known and costly fungus which is becoming endangered. Such kind of endangered fungi are many, and we don't have much data about this particular one also. The largest truffle of the world is the most expensive one is this particular one. And then this is the biodiversity. You can see Allomyces, Chaprolignia, Pythium. Nobody has asked the Pythium to release the juice spores into a vesicle like that, not the Cyprolignia to have juice for angel proliferation. This is the biodiversity. Zygomycota has become very important. One of the important fungi, Saxena vesifam, is uh, discovered by late Professor S.B. Saxena has become an indigenous fungi has become very important in medical mycology. Ketomium is very important in the case of, uh, uh, that is uh, making the uh, diamonds and other things to shine, that industry is flourishing. Textile industry, they are also important. And um, um, this neurospora has contributed a lot for fungal genetics. And also you see number of residue monsters have become very important and nobody can lay down such a beautiful uh, uh, net on the Dictyophora, which is a natural, uh, are the natural existing organism. That is the beauty of the biodiversity. Fungi are more beautiful than our faces and our cells. And now, now this is a fungal biotechnology, which is very important. And you can look into this food applications and useful products and other processes. I would like to mention immunomodulator, a cyclosporin, without cyclosporin. And uh, the, the, it, it has helped to have the revolution of organ transplantation. Without cyclosporin, uh, no organ transplantation thing take place, you can see all other aspects also. So this is how I would like to uh, say that, thank you very much for having given me an opportunity to me to present my particular data on uh, the Indian, and from the Indian perspective, we are lagging behind with the other countries with our own, uh, other surrounding countries like China and Brazil and Thailand. And uh, we need to do much of the work in this particular country. And uh, mycology is the basis Without fungi, there is no life. And um, without taxonomy, there is no science. And uh, without um, fungi, there is no biotechnology, and so on and so forth. So long live fungi and long live mycologists. Thank you very much for having given me an opportunity. And in country like this, in education and as well as agriculture, they are very important. And if you neglect, no country can progress. Thank you very much for having given me an opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hearty congratulations. And thank you for uh, keeping the time, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for providing such a comprehensive overview on the need for fungal taxonomy. Thank you. The next speaker in the session is Dr. Sanjeev Nayaka. He has achieved a proficient name in the field of lichenology and alcology at a very young age. He has recently been honored by the Award in 2020 by Science Nature Science Foundation, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. Dr. Naika is currently working as Senior Principal Scientist at National Botanical Research Institute, Lucknow. And before that, from, uh, before 2001, he also worked as project assistant at Center of Ecological Sciences, 
in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore for two years. Dr. Naika received the uh, revised the genus Lichenera for his doctoral thesis at CSIR. Priyani, this is under the supervision of Dr. D. K. And obtained PhD yes, degree yes, yes, yes. from Dr. RML Awad University, Faizabad. So far, he has described more than 20 new species to sun and has 25 new lecanized and lecaniferous fungi for India. Apart from lecanora, he has revised taxa such as lecithi. Lecidia and Phyllospora from India. Dr. Naika has traveled throughout India and has published lichen floristic accounts for several regions. His major work involves studies on lichens of Himachal Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Gujarat, Eastern Ghats, and Andhra Pradesh. He has surveyed many protected areas, including more than 10 wildlife sanctuaries all over India. Dr. Naika has visited Antarctica twice for studying the lichens and their ecology. Another artistic facet to the personality of Dr. Naika is he is a great artist and he has contributed several illustrations as a guest artist for residents. The Journal of Science Education published by Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore. He has also contributed illustrations for selected articles in journal Current Science and two books as many mammals of India. Uh, Kumaran Sivam and Survival Strategies by Raghavendra Ghadkar, Butterflies of Peninsular India by Krishna Meg Kunte. He was also a volunteer of national service. With this, I request Dr. Sanjeev Naika to please present. Uh, very good morning. Uh, thank you, madam. And um, first of all, thanks to uh, Dr. Deshmukh uh, who uh, nominated um, my name for the fellow of uh, MSI. And also thanks to the, all the um, jury members of MSI for electing me as the fellow of MSI. Uh, I, I have taken this uh, topic, lichen genus Lachenora from India, because I did my PhD in this topic, and I'm still continuing to do uh, work on this uh, on this genus. So um, quite a good uh, amount of data has been accumulated, and uh, it's a time to present it. Um, so, uh, so before coming to the Lachenora directly, a little bit of background of uh, diversity of lichens in the world. There are 20,000 species of lichens are there in the world and there are 1,000 genera, 119 families, 40 order in eight classes. And the percentage of the lichenized Ascomycetes or Ascomycota is more, that is about 99% uh, almost. And if you see some of the major groups of lichens, it is the Lechenora gen, uh, genus Lechenora has more than 500 species. And Parmeliaceae is the largest family in the world. But Lechenorals order and the Lechenoromycetes uh, class are the, the largest class in the order in the lichen um, family, lichen community. And if you see the diversity of lichens, it is the tropical rainforest around the world which has the maximum uh, diversity of lichens. Sometimes you can get 600 species per hectare of, a, of a, an area. And unfortunately, 50% of the tropical mycota or the microbiota are unknown or the underexplored. So coming to the India diversity of lichens in India, we have 2,900 species of lichens. Uh, we have six subspecies, 46 varieties, two pharma. And totally, we have 2,956 uh, taxa, uh, which makes about 14.5% uh, of the world known lichens. Um, and about 19% of the Indian lichen biota is endemic to the country. Uh, from uh, the year 1965 onwards, we have a continuous uh, documentation of the number of lichens being added to the Indian uh, lichen uh, mycota. 
So we, uh, you can see the graph is going exponentially. So as a, and when we explore a new area or when we revise a particular genus or the taxa, any taxa, the num new species or the new reports, distribution records are getting added to the uh, lichen biota of the country. So in the um, lichen biota of the um, country has a more number of crustose lichens followed by folios and then by fruticose lichens. If you the the top uh, 10 uh, families and the uh, genera, so lichenoris you can see one of the top uh, families in the uh, country and gen genus lichenora is one of the largest genera. And uh, if you see the um, the macro lichens, the folios and the fruticose lichens of the country are, you can say, they're well over. And when I took up the study of lichenora, that time the crustal genera, so the micro lichen taxa are not well studied. So, um, so if, if for that matter, if you see the very important uh, key of uh, lichens by Dr. Avasti, that is micro lichen keys, it do not include the key for genus lichenora. So that indicates that the genus is complicated and it has uh, some difficulties in uh, studying. So that is the reason why it took up this uh, genera. And otherwise, if you see lichenora, it is one of the common and the prominent lichen taxa, which has the cosmopolitan in distribution. It is established by the Acarius, a student of uh, Carlinius, uh, and it is based on the lichen species, lichen suffuscus of Linnaeus. Linnaeus, what he did, he described 80 species of the lichens under single genus lichen, and then uh, under a single class, cryptogamy. So among that, uh, this, uh, this is separated. This genus is separated. Then in 1926, Zalbeckner in his classification, he put all the lichenora kind of uh, um, lichens into the, in, in one family, lichenora. So while um, establishing the genus uh, uh, Lechenora, the simple idea was that Apothecia should have the thaline exipal. Thaline exipal in the sense, the exipal is here, it's a margin, you can see, apothecial margin. Apothecial margin should have algal cells, like it has on the thalus. So that is why it is called thaline. So, um, and then simple, it should have hyaline, simple ascospores. So that is a basic criteria. That is why all the, Lichens having, especially the crustose lichen having thylen exipal and hyaline simple ascospore put into genus Lechenora. So Zalbuckner put into the family Lechenoraceae. Then uh, it become it become much heterogeneous. It was observed. It was observed long back. So um, that is why the um, separation started. Uh, Igler realized it uh, long back in 1969 itself. Then Huffelner and Rambord, they gave importance to the uh, hymenial uh, characteristics and also exipal and ascus type also. While doing so, several uh, several uh, uh, species are separated into already established genera like Aspicilia. And then came the importance of the chemistry. You know, in lichens, the chemistry is very much important. Brodo, uh, he utilized the chemistry of the lichens very well by TLC. Then later on, Lumsch and the Fige, they introduced, they went one more step, one more step ahead, and they introduced HPLC. So by doing healthy HPLC and all, the chemistry of the lichen became more clear, especially of this genus, become very clear, and it helped in the segregating the genus into much uniform or the homogeneous uh, groupings. <coughs> Meanwhile, there were some uh, revisionary studies came out from the different part of the world. In, for example, Australia, North America, Middle America, Cesare, Turkey, and all, not much. And, uh, and at present, there are about 550 species of uh, lichen, lichen are there in the world. And in India, when I took up these studies in 2001, there are only 47 species were known. Um, uh, and Dr. Upriti had uh, initially published some papers. And at present, we have 83 species. And uh, still, the genus is uh, heterogeneous uh, because it has all the, the uh, kind of growth forms. It has a crustose growth form. It has effigurate thallus and also it has famulose thallus. And traboxide algae is the uh, main photobiont here. Of course, it is, has the thaline uh, or the lichenora apothecia, hyaline and simple ascospores like this. 
and within the lacinora because its heterogeneity the people divided into two more groups like senso stricto and senso lato senso stricto it should have the crystals in the amphitheum amphitheum the example part margin part it should have crystals in the amphitheum and it should contain uh, aternorin that means it should give k plus yellow reaction siliform conidia and with the algal cells in the amphitheum so this is the characteristic of senso stricto whereas the senso lato will have senso stricto and all the other the uh, species which is categorized uh, put under the genera lacinora genus lacinora and there are two sub group of people have made based on the growth forms one is that uh, lacinora which are crustose mainly crustose where the placodium has the effigurate and the uh, squamulose thallus and there are several groups people have made and it's not necessary that we should follow this group but the sub genus uh, can be followed like dispersa group which is, has the uh like like xanthon in the in its chemistry safasca has aternorin varia has the uh, acetic acid mainly whereas the subgroup safasca is the main group here and it has the four subgroups again safasca is with the uh, crystals in the amphitheum carlins has the uh, dark hypothecium pylida has the uh, uh, prunos disc whereas the marginata has the example dark colored example margins it has that is why it is in margin marginata so for my studies i had studied more than 1500 uh, specimens from the uh, from which are uh, preserved in the herbarium lwg you know this lwg herbarium is one of the largest in uh, asia and it has the collections of both avasti uh, avasti the personal collection of the avasti and the now the all the material from the lucknow university is also, also transferred to the lwg lwg um and then we have lots of exegetes and specimens deposited by the visitors since nbri herbarium lwg is a national facility so according to the guidelines the people has to deposit their uh, cryptogamic samples into the uh, in, into our herbarium so that is why we have lots of samples uh, deposited by the visitors apart from that we i had collected or the we had a fresh collections from the several places himachal pradesh i was working in the project uh, as a project assistant that is why we have collections from the himachal pradesh karnataka kerala madhya pradesh sikkim and all so these are some of the places regularly visited so that is why we had a fresh collections apart from that we have borrowed some specimen from the uh, kolkata herbarium and from the some foreign herbarium specially type materials and the lichen specimens are identified based on the substratum morphology anatomy and chemistry morphology studied under stereo microscope Uh, and uh, anatomy by the light microscope and thin hand cut section was mounted in the plain water and all measurements were taken and to see the characters very clearly uh, koh solution was used and also ho3 was used to study the crystals uh, in the amphitheum and all chemistry was studied by spartes tlc and hplc hplc i didn't do but um, the uh, dr lunch helped us in not doing the hplc and routine reagent of k k c and pd were used and tlc was performed in the solvent system a and parmenio valichan was used as a control in the tlc whereas the solaranic acid and benzoic acid was the control in the uh, hplc all the identified materials were matched with the type material whenever possible at least they were matched with the exigent materials available in the herbarium and uh, what are the uh, substratum possible for the uh, lacinora if they can be carticolous growing on the bark like this or it can be saxicolous growing on the rock or there are some lacinoras which also grew on the uh, soil here and what are the growth forms growth type as i already told you it is crustose effigurate or the squamulose and uh, the texture of the thallus is very much important by identifying the lichen lacinora so it may be smooth uh, or it may be cracked areolate like this or it is very coloose here it is bulbate thallus you can see there may be uh, secondary structures Uh, there are no isidia seen in the lacinora but there are soridia possible and pycnidia is a common thing you can see here and the thallus margin is important sometimes you can see a dark line here line like this it's called prothallus or the um, uh, margin so attachment is very much important it is sessile and constricted here it is sub sessile here you can see one small um, stipe is there it may be immersed or semi immersed or sub immersed this is important it can have the pruna here it can see white pruna here or e prunos and 
margin important you can see thick smooth margin is there here the margin is very much reduced thin margin is there here here the margin is bead kind of a beaded kind of things and here flexors and the margin again here the color is important very clearly we have the other kind other um, uh, margins uh, but usually we have a calm colorous margin here talon margin here it is dark and sometimes it is yellow and the disc it can be plain concave or the convex and anatomical character of the apothecia is very much important so um, the this is the uh, cross section of the apothecia diagrammatic view here you can see the margin part or it is called amphitheum or exapel part it has algae and crystals if the crystals are very small and spreading towards the cortex part then it is called alafana if it is restricted to the small crystal restrict to the medulla part then it is called campus twist type and if the large crystals are there and it is making a group then it is called polycarious type whereas the melacarpella type has this both small and the large crystals Allophora type and the combustible type, the small crystals get dissolved when you administer, uh, administer the KOH. Whereas the combustible type, uh, whereas the polycarious and the melacarpella type, large crystals remain, so they don't dissolve. The epihelminum character is very much important. So color and the crystals are the epihelminum. In the chloroterra type, the crystals are a little larger and uh, uh, it is brownish in color. It get dissolved in the K K solution. Whereas in the polycarious type small crystals and the uh, pigment dissolves in the k whereas in the ganglionin type the color changes so brownish color changes or sometimes bluish color will be there it changes to greenish it is called ganglionia type whereas in gabbleta type glabbleta type there are no crystals and also pigments will not dissolve so in the apothecial uh, in the ascus character the tholus is very much important character ocular chamber and when you put a small drop of iodine it gives this kind of coloration so paraphyses are branched they may not be may or may not be anastomosed whereas the ascus pores are simple hyaline and usually they are ellipse ellipsoidal in size this is the chemistry and some of the tlc uh, profile of the uh, lecanora and some of the hplc profile so once we have the morphological anatomical chemical characters and all so we uh, construct a key like this this is the dichotomous key simple keys and this is the detailed description of the Like in our how the how we discuss name and the citation, phylogenetic characters, anatomy, chemistry, habitat, distribution, and also every species is matched with the similar species, and then this uh, specimen ex examined is written and also given both the um, thallus morphology, anatomy, and distribution map. And the result, uh, what I got uh, as I told in the beginning, we I got uh, 83 species and one subspecies and four varieties. And 36 species are added as new to the lichen biota under this genus, and four species are described as a new species, and 37 species of lichen are reported earlier from India are excluded now because their existence is doubtful or identity is erroneous. So sometimes the some specimens are untraceable also to confirm their identity. Eight species of lichen are now transferred into other genera, and 76 taxa belonging to uh, lichen ora. Uh, while twelve lecanora subgenus lecanora, while twelve species are belong to subgenus Placodia. Within the subgenus lecanora, maximum are subfast group about sixty nine species, and Western Himalaya records the maximum number of species followed by Western Ghats. So this is the complete list of lecanora um, from India, and these are the thirty seven species that are excluded from India because of the various reasons. And the, as I told you, chemical diversity. we could get about 30 uh, uh, different kinds of chemistry chemical substances or the secondary metabolites in lecanora among them not all are major compounds some which are the highlighted ones are the major ones like arthotoline adrenorin ganglodin nostatic acid panarin protocitric acid soromic acid uh, stictic acid acetic acid zeorin are some of the major compounds that is present in the lecanora and these chemical compounds are the very important identification of this uh, lecanora into different species and as i told you uh, so if you see the geographic regions western ghats has the uh, western himalaya has the maximum diversity followed by western ghats and that is why these western ghats and western himalaya have much similarities and if you see the altitudinal range this middle altitude uh, this is uh, 2001 to 2500 favors most of the Lecanora to grow, 
uh, and otherwise the alpine area has a very less uh, lichens and uh, it is uh, tropically there are more li more lichen or ice but in uh, if you go to the uh, alpine areas or the temperate places but lichen or ice are the prominent uh, lichen species which can which found when growing on the rock surfaces and all especially lichen or muralis lichen or caraway the leaf and so there are some five six species which are prominently available in the higher altitudes and i'll not go into all the species some i'll have touch on the some of the uh, new species which uh, i have described one is the lichenora luteo marginata this species uh, the, this is uh, described based on the uh, materials preserved in the herbarium by k dange by in 1976 collections so the peculiarity of this lichen is a saxicolus and it has a yellow margin so uh, and also it has the all other characters of the lichenora suffusca having the large crystals and all prominently yellow margin it is there so that is why uh, the, the, this is a described as a luteo marginata there are no other species in the lichenora at that time which had yellow margin so it was close to like uh, like uh, lichenora hensini but uh, he or it case apart from the callus mar um, apothecial margin um, uh, it uh, differs the hensini differs by having the filicaris type of high epihymenium whereas we had glabrator type so another sub species described is parasitis parasitis sensis um because there is already one species known uh, as the, the parasitens so which has the 16 uh, spores in the ascus whereas we also have the 16 ascus spores the major difference between these uh, our species and the earlier the existing species is the epihymenium we had glabrator type whereas the earlier known species had the corator type and this again based on the uh, material present in the herbarium so this is the new species lichenora gorigangensis this species described by, by based on the my collections from the himachal pradesh um, as i told you that time there was a project going on uh, of the himalaya uh, and the major difference here between the already existing species that alba uh, is that uh, alba had the uh, asne uh, asne acid and uh, yes, love to hear yeah yeah yes i'll close and the your time yeah i am closing in uh, only one uh, one slide or two slide so lighter disc it has and the larger ascus spore whereas the upreti we this is, this is dedicated uh, one species of lecanora to dr upreti and this is again a species collected by me um, in a team from the himachal pradesh now it differs from the already existing flavida fusca by having the um, uh, i mean uh, larger ascus spores and the uh, light uh, lighter uh, apothecial disc so this is last slide um see uh, there are several uh, new records of lichenora we described for the country but lichenora full, full west is very, very strange and very interesting uh, species because you don't this see this species in the field so it is a very small small apothecia very small patch of lichens when you collect the lichens in bulk and when you see study them under the microscope for the other prominent species you get them so okay this also has this many this lichens so initially we thought it is a new species but later on we realized that it is a new record already recorded uh, species In interesting character here it is it has a yellow margin and yellow dense pruna on the disc so this is a very peculiar character of this species like nor fulvestra this is collected from the one workshop we conducted in the uh, kamraj uh, um, engineering college at indical i mean at uh, madurai Uh, in tamil nadu and we had a field work to dindigal district the sirumala hills there we collected and it's now it's a new record for the um, country and otherwise it's a pantropical species earlier known from the china so thank you very much uh, for your um, patient hearing and uh, certainly i would like to acknowledge a few people uh, director nbri my guide dr kipu prethi um, and also colleagues and the students of technology department um and the minister of environment and forest which uh, which sponsored the project that uh, icoptex project where the where i was a project assistant in the um, himachal pradesh project so under this project um, i could finish this work and thank you very much thank you hearty Hartik. congratulations to uh, sanjeeva nayak thank you sir thank you congratulations dr sanjeeva thank you thank you patients and you very nicely uh, summarize the taxonomy of lecanora its global status 
And the best part is we have shown a ray of hope that there has been surge in the taxonomy since 2010. So congratulations. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Congratulations, Dr. Naika. Yashpal here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. <Dexter. laughs> yeah. Nice, nice presentation and congratulations for being the Thank fellow you. of a prestigious society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, congratulations, Sanjeev. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> of the session, Professor Pradeep Varma, who is an eminent professor at the Department of Microbiology, Central University of Rajasthan, Krishnagarh, Rajasthan. He obtained his BSc, MSc in Microbiology from Maharishi Dayanand Saraswati University. Post that, he joined as a research scholar in Sardar Patel University, uh, Gujarat, specializing in the field of microbiology and received a degree in the year 2002. In the same year, he was selected as UNESCO Fellow and he joined Czech Academy of uh, uh, as UNESCO Fellow in the Academy of Sciences, Perag. He later moved Perag to work as post doctoral Fellow. In the year 2004, he joined as visiting scientist at UFZ Center for Environmental Research, Germany. He was awarded DFG Fellowship, which provided him another opportunity to work as post doctoral Fellow at Göttingen University, Germany. He moved to India in the year 2007, where he joined Reliance Health Sciences and worked extensively on bio production, which attributed few patents to his name. Professor Verma's field of expertise includes bioprocess development, fermentation technology, development of biomimetic systems. The Burma holds 10 international patents, which we seldom see in any biodata from India, that they have so many patents to their credit. My congratulations to you in the field of microwave-assisted biomass free treatment and biobutanol production. He's recipient of various prestigious awards and honors of national and international repute. To cite a few, Ron Cockcroft Award by Swedish Society, UNESCO Fellow, ASCR Para, JSPS Fellow, Japan. With this, I request Professor Varma to please present his talk. Thank you, madam, for uh, giving me opportunity to uh share my view with uh, as a MSF fellow this year nominated to me and I'm uh, my I'm mainly focusing on the biosphere prospecting of fungi and I am working on the fungi from last 20 years and various my PhD on the fungi I also work with the uh, enzymes there and I also when moved to the abroad also I associate with them I try to develop those uh, molecules which is secreted by the fungi and try to mimic the reactions. So that is also the expertise the system and this is natural way of phenomena. So with this, so I've given my talk on bioprocessing on a biologic solution. So if you look about this, uh, how much important uh, this uh, fungi is, because if you see the morning lecture, depending on the taxonomy and other part of uh, things, if you look about the bioprospects of fungi, which can by, uh, by agriculture, uh, enzyme, vitamins, bioactive uh, bio compounds. So my work is focusing on a, how to this fungi, which can be isolated in a laboratory level to scale up the process and try to develop uh, to key compound to be produced by this. Uh, so my focus really, uh, especially focus on the two aspect. Uh, two, uh, when I moved to the uh, was, uh, was founder head of Assam, uh, Department of Microbiology. So I have when moved to the Rajasthan, so I have a collaborative project from DBT and ER projects. So we have isolated so many fungal strains around more than 100 and uh, around uh, around 40 we isolated, uh, we are screened and we identified those strains and some have a very, very, uh, you know, have a economic importance. 
And some of them which has been published in this work, I will try to show you, uh, which has been useful for bioengine production, which is especially used for the biorefinery industries. Apart from that, we also, when I moved to Rajasthan, which is a hot uh, uh, spot of diversity, where we have isolated uh, a lot of strains, which is basidomyces, and we have found the a typical type of uh, enzyme or cases, which is uh, very rarely explored. So in order to uh, uh, enhance our knowledge on biotechnology aspect of this, uh, this fungi, and I, I have focused my talk on this aspect. So uh, in this, in this, we, we've, if you if you look about the fungal diversity, especially Assam and Rajasthan, I will share my uh, slides to you. But what are the objectives we decided that uh, uh, morphological phenotypic identification we have carried out, and what are the screening method has been adopted to screen the uh, primary identifications and LCMS studies for extracellular proteomes, and the, what is the potential of this uh, fungi and the molecules which has been secreted by them to for industrial purposes. So, so what methodology we have screen the isolated fungi, which we are all, all doing on the laboratories for us. Morphological phenotypic value characterization has been carried out. And then we have to find out the primary screening and what we are looking for that by active compound. So my work on this particular talk is focusing on the two uh, types of things. One or uh, two are the, one of this hydrolytic enzyme and second is the lignotic enzymes. And especially hydrolytic enzymes, we, we talk about the cellulose and generalis, which is a key. And uh, since I'm, I have a patented, so I know the 50% part of the particular cost of the biofuel is goes to the enzyme. So that is why my, my focus on these two, three enzymes in this particular talk and how the fungi is especially economically important uh, to address those issues and why the screening of the particular fungi is important to address. So uh, we, if, if, if we know that uh, the gyalinases, if you look the composition of biomasses, we have 100% com uh, composition minus around 40 to 50% cellulose, if you different type of biomasses, if you look about that, a hemicellulose is a major part, 25 to 25 to 30% and uh, lignin, which is around 15 to 20%. If you look about that, if you, we, we maximum part of the cellulose can be uh, utilized this uh, to convert this uh, cellulose to the sugar or glucose. So how this particular hemocellular part, which is 25 to 30% can be utilized. So gyalinase is one of the enzyme, which is uh, hydrolyzes beta form over linkages, and it can be utilized this uh, to, the, to the sugar form. And the monosaccharides, which is dialose, dialotriose, dialose triose, and all this can be used as a, as a bio, for the use for the biofuel purpose. So, so our, our, our group was aimed to have a make a cocktail, which is those and uh, the screen, which is we isolated the screen and not the commercial one. We also, I will try to show in the later slides all of these, the commercial screen we uh, used, where the, the um, enzyme has been used and comparison study will be done where we are all isolated. Stay. Sorry to interrupt you, Professor Verma. If you could project your slide, we can have a bigger view of your slides. I tried to. Yeah, sorry. Now it's okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, similarly, we uh, also focus on the cellulose. As I told you, we have isolated cellulose fungi, which can be produced uh, cellulose and the market properties, which has been produced by the new isolated stain, which has been deported by me. And these are, you know, the, how the cellulose, uh, different group of enzyme, whether endoglucanase, exoglucanase, and cellulose, beta glucoside, these are the cocktail enzymes is required. And these are the stains, which has producing uh, a good total amount of uh, enzyme, which can be utilized for the bi biofuel industry. And not only for biofuel industry, for the probiotic also. And uh, like that is what we have used for the probiotic also. And we have published this paper in, uh, in a couple of good journals, which I will show, show, share with you. And another part is that uh, we have in Rajasthan, we especially isolate the basidomycid, which is we consider the uh, tropical hotspots and uh, near the located industries, the uh, where the dye industries are there, and we have find this uh, lekkes. At uh, if you look at lekkes, there there's a two type of lekkes are there: a typical and uh, typical. Typical, there is a copper containing. Although they have a copper containing compound, are there, but their resonance and their structural movement uh, depend upon the 
depend on the amino acids uh, availability, uh, they have to be called. The blue vacuoles generally have a absorption maximum around 600 to 610 nanometers, and they have metal content and they have radiator required. These are the common available lacase available. But what we observe at typical lacase, which is white lacase and yellow lacase, which is we found in a two stain, uh, which is the so called Mycotheca variola and so for your species, and we, which is the absence of this particular peaks, and this is the anomalous metal content are there. White lake is the incomplete oxidation of CU and the place of the CU with the FE. And if you say that like, like, uh, yellow lake is with the heterogeneity of the glycol acid, higher detox protection, and mediator non required. So these are the two uh, special uh, type of lake cases, atypical lake cases, we which have focus our talks. So, so what is the mechanism? As I said, there's a, in, uh, one type of lake cases, the mediator required, where the uh, lake cases, oxide, uh, oxide lake cases, uh, uh, with the presence of oxygen, uh, uh, water is formed, oxidized lacase, and then substrate, it, in the substrate, then it's oxidized substrate and lacase. So the similarly mediator is, uh, role is that it enhances the process at re uh, reactions, and they are, but these mediators are very expensive. So that is why this uh, particular uh, atypical lacase is very important for environmental nutrition uh, applications. And as you all know, all know that, uh, the uh, lacase is a very wide applications uh, like uh, cotton, jute, food industries, advances in biofuels. And these are the, some of the applications which are also focusing in our laboratory. So these are the one of the very, very uh, popular review article which has been published by us with the uh, bioresource and bioprocessing. So uh, if you look at the production part, when we screen these isolates, uh, then we have used a particular media compared to those media, those people have used uh, the production of cellulose gyalinus and the mental speaker we, we have used for cellulose uh, and gyalinus productions. And for the lacase, we have used uh, two type of strain which has been uh, mainly focused in our laboratory. So M1, M2 media, which is slightly, uh, M2 media is slightly different uh, than the previous media which I used by, by myself. And this strain was identified uh, phenotypically uh, and also the genetically. <coughs> and then the sacrification was done and then by the medicine of a study was performed. So it, if you look about this uh, 22 strain, which has been, uh, we have been found. It is the, I'm showing on those strain, which is a very, very significant and produces some specific biomolecule. And some of them I'm especially focusing in my lab and um, and when we are trying to check, check the uh, activities. And so these have been some of the, these by 22 strains have been uh, we isolated and uh, phenotypically identified. Similarly, we also isolated the residuomycetes. Uh, or, uh, so these are the from Rajasthan regions and uh, some of them we identified. So, so first plate assay has been conducted for the analysis. And if you look, uh, if you have a giant supplemented plate flooded with iodine, the clean zone has been formed where it shows the giant activity. It shows the, how much zone is there, big zone is there, how much uh, it produces the giant So we are, then similarly, we have yeah. also conducted for the lacase activity. We have oxid, uh, orthodiazine plate, supplemented plate that are there. And you can see this oxidized, this orthodiazine. And the plate assays will give us the identification how efficient the lacase producer or janus producer or uh, cellulose producer there. So among this 36 stains of a uh, screen from Assam regions, we have been found around two is particular because we have to see the potentiality, how this is particularly economically important and in industrial level. So we have to lose those stains only. So we I focus on two stains, which is the 17 numbers and 20 number, which for the cellulose gyalinase. And strain uh, two lacase producing, which is a, a typical lacase, uh, which is so-called white lacase and yellow lacase. So these are the four strains which have been talking in uh, next talks. Uh, LC1, as well as the ORIG, which is, uh, we had deposited this culture and I, uh, and IRI, and uh, Sajofna Kamini, which is also deposited with uh, ICM NMC. And microcytium arivova and so for the acid for like stain. So these are the colony morphological and the primary assay techniques we have been used. And then we have to show the production stage, how these have been produced a larger scale. So we have been used still uh, 
Mental security uh, medium for the especially already a child child community for this BSM media, and then uh, uh, this particular uh, so called Mycotherium varivova Stophoria species has been used for the uh, uh, white or yellow cases. So these are the simple media which have been used, and then after that, uh, also some of the compound uh, I want to say that some of the fungi is. Uh, which have been isolated with very, very good characteristic antagonist property. And we are trying to isolate these metabolites, which can be uh, have a medicinal use. So this is just, I want to show this slide to you, which is uh, uh, against the plant patches, aspergillus, which we have in the laboratory. And this is uh, showing the antagonist, uh, some of the stain against this stain. So, so to, another, and to understand better understanding, to unexplore uh, fungal diaspora, various colonies of Assam and Rajasthan, we have isolation diverse fungal strain from Assam and Rajasthan, gyrinous cellulose lacus activity of pumpkin with both plate assay, quantity assay, and these cellulose strain have been used for the uh, large scale studies. So now when we have, we have used this media, then we have to say that the response surface methodology, uh, CCD RSM, as you know that, and we find that when we play with the factors, which is uh, in the laboratory, so rice straw when they use a substrate and temperature and variation with rice straw with the pH or uh, minimum medium salt like any sulfate temperature. And we found this challenge at 3.8 fold is increased. Uh, similarly, if you see uh, CMC, here I, can, I would like to add, here is the wheat straw is a uh, good substrate for cellulose productions. Uh, it can be increased around 5.3 fold of increase of the activity or FES is, is around 6.2 fold ahead activities. So these are the published by resource.com and the AMB Express, uh, which is uh, highly cited nowadays. So the same thing is uh, with the lekkage, which I talk about the white lekkage, myelothesium, which is produced. For, I, I, as far as my knowledge, uh, this is the first type of report. I reported a typical lekkage from Rajasthan, and this is myelothesium, Arriva. the other states are also available in, uh, in Sweden, but they, we have reported this strain here in, in Rajasthan, and the Stouphoria species, which is other uh, atypical yellow like cases. And this also, again, we are optimize those uh, parameters with the CCRSM, and we find this increased fold of a particular fold of increase. And this paper has been we have published in the International Macromolecules and uh, Biosource Technology Reports. So uh, uh, when we are working on this uh, the process development, then we observe that a uh, lot of, uh, when, if you look compared with the bacterial uh, uh, um, uh, enzymes. Uh, we found that uh, ATP system is, a, is a very, very important. And they're being uh, for isolated fungal stains, uh, which can be purified with this ATP techniques. So, when if you look about the, uh, when we look about the purification, we use the dialysis, ultra diffusion, chromatography, which is a multi step process and it is expensive. And protein may be lost uh, or due to the low, low yield. So cannot be scaled up or scale up, but it is a very high expensive procedure. And that is why the enzyme cost is increased in the industry level. So we try to develop access to phase system with a fact salt has been combination has been done. And fungal system uh, enzyme is associated with this very nicely work with the fact salt system. And this is a one step process system. And it is cost effective and by compared with the high yield, because uh, we compare with the yield with the traditional. Uh, uh, concept and we easily scale up the process. So if you look over gyrinus, if you see the multi-step process, which is where you use the anion exchange chromatography, uh, gel filtration chromatography, and compare with the ATPS system, APEX system, we found the 13 percent uh, fold increase of the uh, activity. Similarly, if you look, uh, this paper has been published with the International Macromolecules. Um, similarly, we have also uh, associated with the cellulase, which is being charge of the community. And if you see this uh, particular uh, multi step process and ATP with MNSO for salt completions, we found the 10.4 uh, increase of the activity. And similarly, we found the ATP capable less, like is also uh, conventionally we easily profile with the ATP system. So, this is also uh, we published ATP spec system for the like is in environmental technology innovation as well. So, uh, if you look about the asparagology, or IG, which is which, which particular work on the dialysis, and we have, if we do the secretome of a particular dialysis protein, uh, we uh, conducted the LCMSMS study, which we found this around, um, around uh, if, if you secretome, if you found so many different uh, uh, 
scrutinized uh, no of no office bearers or any members cannot compel the uh, msi to give fellow without nominations at this uh, old age professor manogracharya filled his nomination papers and he has submitted to the uh msi and it is interesting that professor manogracharya scored the, uh, the top score in the panel and uh, 
he was already awarded with the lifetime achievement award so the next scorers uh, i mean highest scorers dr sanjeeva nayak and uh, uh, professor pratip verma they were uh, selected and awarded by mycological society of india uh, dr v agniyotri memorial award 2021 to dr sanjeeva nayak botanical research institute lucknow uh, professor professor pc jain memorial award uh, to professor uh, uh, pratip verma central university of rajasthan ajmer congratulations uh, for uh, uh, dr nayak thank you sir uh, so, uh, professor pratip verma for the excellent award from the uh, msi thank, thank you, you very much sir. thank you very much sir all the best thank you professor varma it was indeed a very interesting talk you very lucidly explained the entire methodology of identifying the fungi and isolating and trying to crystallize the fungi i am sure the younger fraternity would have benefited from this talk i really enjoyed listening to you thank you ma'am thank you and congratulations for the fellowship thank and for thanks. the award to the msi give this you. award and thank you all of you thank you thank you sir so the next the last speaker for the session is a close friend of mine dr mahavir prasad sharma who is work, currently working in agriculture research service as principal scientist at indian institute of soybean research in dot ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare government of india dr sharma earned his undergraduate and masters degree in agriculture from rajasthan agriculture university bikaner and completed his phd from teddy and jivaji university gwalior in 2002 he has received gold model award during his masters program and he did his post graduate diploma in intellectual property rights from indira gandhi national open university new delhi he received he achieved post doctoral uh, experience in soil biology from usda arc bach bellsville uh, usa for which he was awarded by dbt crust overseas award dr sharma then started his career in microbial research at university of delhi and terry new delhi and after serving terry for 11 years he joined in ars at icar senior microbiologist in 2006 he has visited research institute of indian agriculture prix switzerland indian in institute sorry institute of organic agriculture prix switzerland institute of technology and agroscope zurich uh, switzerland for developing linkages in microbial research and soil nutritional aspects from in july 2015 Dr Sharma is recipient of several awards and best paper presentations he is also recipient of best paper award from national young scientist award for his contribution on glomelin a potential soil carbon sequester evaluated as organic and inorganic farming practices he has developed Uh, a gene pool of soybean rhizobia from malwa region of central india out of which identified two potential root nodulating soybean rhizobia capable of enhancing modulation and soybean growth which are being commercialized shortly for field utilization in soybean he has sta standardized same midi system for identifying cultural microbes and studying microbial community he has optimized single spore culture technique of mycorrhizal fungi and has optimized protocol of glomelin extraction in soil to study soil 
carbon sequestration. He is currently managing seven research projects as PI and co-PI and has published more than 15, 15 papers and 28 book chapters and 27 conference presentations. Dr. Mahavir Sharma is well known for his research in the field of arbuscular mycorrhiza plant interactions carbon sequestration on on farm production of am fungi in signature fatty acid biomarkers among many others may I request dr sharma to please present his talk thank you very much uh, professor rupam uh, really a great pleasure is I'm audible to all? Yeah, yeah you are right, sir. And my, my slide is also visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. You may continue. So, first of all, uh, I think uh, the, the last, uh, that, that today is second day, and I congratulate the MSI, particularly the activity committee, uh, and the chairmanship of Dr. Rupam, and uh, the other office leaders, and more importantly, the, uh, the organizers of Patiala. Totally flawless meeting, and it's a very wonderful meeting we all are enjoying rather listening to the seniors and stalwarts. So, uh, and thank you very much, sir, for having the I'm here to make a presentation on uh, 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 the appraisal of native mycorrhizal fungi improving the plant productivity, soil health, uh, and sequestering soil carbon uh, in natural ecosystems. So, the structure of my presentation is the challenges and the, how, how the mycorrhiza is relevant in meeting the 2030 agenda of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yesterday, uh, Rupam has uh, highlighted the Sustainable Development Goals, which is you know, to, uh, 10 years left to meet the agenda of 2030, where the micro idea is really uh, very much important to meet that agenda. And the management of native micro uh, resident micro fungi in improving the plant productivity, as we all know, if we are using the introduced strains, that may not be competent. So, we rather, we should focus on the use of native MF and target the management system so that we can harness the full potential of microbial fungi in agro ecosystems. And then I will be discussing the, how the mycorrhiza secretes one glycoprotein we call glomerulin and how it can be recovered from soil and then how it, it contributes to the carbon sequestration. Some case studies we have, I will be touching upon uh, as one of the projects we have recently concluded uh, from DBT and uh, DST. And then I will be also touching about the liquid biomarkers. You know, the lipids are, you know, uh, one of the structural component membrane lipids of the microbes. And these biomarkers can use as a signature for mycorrhiza also, apart from other microbe, microbial communities. And then I will also be discussing about the, how the mycorrhiza can be mass produced. And then finally, to how to test the quality of these products available in the market and some, uh, and what could be the way out and future direction of research. So uh, the challenges uh, has already been discussed uh, in earlier speakers that we know the intensive use of uh, external inputs, resource, uh, the, uh, the fertilizers, pesticides, although it was needed in the in 70s to meet the billion population, Indian population. But now you see the adverse impact is coming and uh, uh, we are really not uh, sustaining our uh, soil health in terms of delivery in the optimum output and the products. So, the, and of course, uh, the sustainable development goal number two, which deals with the zero hunger, and that is, you know, everybody has to be, uh, we have to meet the demand for food for all, and uh, that will always be there. And uh, the at present uh, 142 million hectare area is available for agriculture, the irrigated area, which is more, more most potential, apart as compared to 329 million hectare geographical area available in our country. So you see less than half is available and some more area will go to other product uh, projects, government projects, roads and buildings, everything globalizing taking place. So only option left before us to increase the input use efficiency. Whatever we are applying, that has to uh, give the more output. So, and and that's why we need the, the alternatives so that we can uh, sustain our productivity and trend is declining as I already explained. And uh, apart from this, uh, the one area, which is the climate change, as we all know, at present that CO2 level in the atmosphere is 400. And you know, the safe limit is 280 at present. So we are already at the alarming stage and we all are, all are experiencing the high temperature and 
the uh, because of the elevation of CO2, the global warming and the climate change. The global warming is because of because of the elevated temperature and uh, global climate change is because of the elevated CO2. So both are you know uh, yeah, together. So uh, that uh, we have to look that how we can uh, curtail the CO2 emission in the environment without compromising the crop productivity. So this uh, this mycorrhiza and also we need to maintain the soil quality, soil health. And uh, as you know, the organic farming is is, is gaining momentum nowadays. Everybody is talking about PM, honorable PM is also stressed upon the uh, organic farming. And their only alternative left is a mycorrhiza because no other option is left because where the phosphorus will come. So this phosphorus, uh, only mycorrhiza can uh, serve the purpose to uh, mobilize, the channelize the availability of phosphorus and other nutrients. As far as the total protocol, as we all know, the United Nations Framework on Climate Change in 1997, it was, you know, the 150 countries were agreed that time. And when India was one of the signatories in 2002 for this protocol. And eventually, uh, that was uh, the Clinton government at that time. And then after the Bush administration, the US did not agree. And the Department of Students. Depends that economic test. So, the debate physics department. Say, say, they said the US did not agree, and it was now. I request others to please. Impact of technology intervention. So, in 2012, this UN FCC. Ma'am, maybe, ma'am, ye karna hai kuch yahan pe. Present. Please, uh, please, uh, you unmute yourself. Uh, mute yourself and then talk so, so that others will not be disturbed. So, so this is a UNFCC in 2012, it was ended. And although uh, we, all countries are sensitizing, we all are sensitized that we have to curtail the use of the, uh, curtail the CO2 emission in the environment. But still, uh, we have to focus on how to curtail the CO2 emission in the environment without compromising from the proper activity. And also some area is already uh, uh, created like thermal power plants and other uh, wastelands that is also vulnerable ecosystem where uh, we have to look for some alternative and there the role of mycorrhiza comes so that's why i am here to make the presentation how the mycorrhiza is relevant in these areas as we all know has been already explained that about 80 percent plants are colonized on earth through this mycorrhiza except some exceptions and uh, this it is you know the hyphal extension is taking place when mycorrhiza is there and attached to the root system of the plant and uh, it, it acts as the extended root system of the plant and that acquire more nutrients uh, from the soil otherwise plant is not able to take uh, it is difficult for the plant to take uh, particularly under stress conditions so through the hyphal network uh, the plant can cope up the stress condition and can uh, you know it can help the plant uh, growth and it also helps in the drought tolerance a lot of work has been carried out and some uh, uh, the mechanism are also been specified by many workers. And apart from this, mycorrhiza also helps in the disease resistance. Uh, like one uh, one good uh, review has been published long back by James uh, Rips, and that basically deals how the mycorrhiza. It, it is basically it is not directly controlling. It is directly indirectly controlling. It's a masking effect. Like when the plant is colonized by mycorrhiza and pathogen is out there, both are surviving there. Only thing the plant can cope up because of the changes in the physiology of the plant and nutritional changes in the plant. So it uh, helps the production to the plant uh, under this, uh, the biotic stress condition. And then, uh, it also produces humic substance, uh, we call organic glue, that uh, I will be discussing in detail, that how the glomerulin is relevant. And this glomerulin acts as a binding uh, to, uh, for the soil aggregation purpose. In 200 years back, we were not knowing how the sand dunes were stabilized. But that time, the glomerulin was playing a greater role. It is only two decades back, the Mithilis relig, he has, uh, and the Wright and Upadha and others, they have, uh, you know, although they have now not working on glomerulin, the Chinese and we people are working, but the US is not working largely on the glomerulin, but they have the inventors in uh, 1999, about uh, 20 years back. But still, uh, there is a lot of the scope there of the glomerulin, that how this glomerulin can help in the carbon sequestration and we all know that mycorrhiza only needs the carbon and that is available uh, from the plant and the plant only needs the uh, you know the nutrients and other resources that is available through the uh, mycorrhizal fungi 
and uh, this is how the many papers we have published. One of the latest review published in Current Science with Professor DJ Magera, and it was very good review and highly cited paper that how the mycorrhiza is helpful phosphorus increase in the plant. And they, as far as the current taxonomy is concerned, as uh, our stalwart in the morning talk, Professor Manoratari already narrated and explained. But uh, the nutshell that uh, the latest position of at present we are having 31 genera uh, and uh, eight, uh, you know, the, under the order domains. And the major two orders uh, 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 that comprises of uh, about uh, 30 genera, mainly glomerules and gigasporans. And that has been published in 2012. Others maybe latest paper might have appeared, but I have not gone through that because I do not work on the taxonomy, but I feel for the audience purpose, I thought I should explain this. So then how to manage the microbial fungi? Uh, that was our long experience working on soybean. And as we know that the changing cropping pattern and the management practice that we make is, uh, influences the microbial functioning and the growth of the plant. It's already been established by many workers. The Paul Matter is published long back, 36 year old trial from the uh, Switzerland in, in science report in 2000 and 2002. And that deals with the, how the management practice affect the microbial function. So it becomes evident that there are certain resident microbial fungi uh, which, which helps uh, uh, improve the plant productivity rather than the exotic strain that may not be compatible. So that's why I am highlighting my talk is highlighting my, mainly dealing with the uh, native strain, resident microbial spores, uh, the microbial communities. And we observed the higher Population and affinity of glomus species in the maize and soybean crop production we published in long back about a decade back in the general of sciences, highly cited paper. And in this uh, work we have carried out when we use the maize in the rotation along with the soybean, the, the growth is increased tremendously. And uh, apart from growth, that also sustains the higher biomass of mycorrhiza in terms of the inoculum potential. And also the tillage practice also impact. When they you, you use the reduced less practice and uh, use the uh, maize in the rotation, the microbial population and the yield uh, uh, also increases. So it, it means that, that there is an impact of crop and soil practices which has to be taken into account while working in you know, managing the native strains in the cropping system. So, so that a, a day will come when we will not able to uh, introduce our strains in the soil. We have to have a system in hand so that you know the system automatically takes care of. Uh, because one of the members from planning commission, he visited our institute uh, five, four or five years back, uh, Dr. Bhargava, and he asked me one question that, uh, why you want to inoculate in your soils? Because it's very difficult, because how to transport and the quality and everything is becoming a problem. So rather you have to develop a system where the system automatically takes care of to sustain the plant production. This is one of the area where we have to find out the uh, native system, crop and soil management practices to harness the potential of whatever is done or niche based mycorrhizal fungi are there. And then uh, we also find out that what kind of mycorrhiza are you know, uh, uh, working under the soybean with the maize system and uh, the conversion release practices. And we have taken the samples and then we segregated and we further grown with the use of maize and soybean. We have two uh, traps. Uh, we use two plant species and then we have come out that out of uh, these two hosts, this is a long term trial. The soybean maize intercropping system, and these are the species we have recovered out of all the glomus, which is uh, the glomus interface. Now, the rhizophagus irregularis found, found to be predominant, colonizing both the host plants. So, this fungal fungi can be target for the mass production purpose, and uh, that's why uh, this can be uh, you know mass produced and. Uh, commercialize it and for the large scale application, particularly called the Central India uh, for the Marwari where the soybean is the major crop. And uh, as uh, the crop rotation, it means that crop rotation influences the microbial parameters. Maize showed the highest microbial biomass, which coincides with like, higher grain yield. So, conventional reduced delay is found to be the better in terms of the higher microbial biomass than the conventional delay. In this glomus uh, interdices or rhizophagus is found to be the dominant species, colonizing both the host, and this can be used for immigration. And then, uh, then, the, then one, one thing definitely comes then what should be the basis, how we should go ahead for the application purpose. So, there are many criteria are being set by us. Some people are working just targeting the colonization. They are taking 10 different types of species and one type of mycorrhiza, two types of mycorrhiza, or 10 types of mycorrhiza with one host. 
So what should be the criteria to select the best candidate? So one criteria I suggest that rather than targeting the colonization, we should target the phosphate uptake in the plant. That at the vegetative stage, rather than growing the plant for three months, maybe we can target uh, for one month and terminate the experiment, see what is the phosphate level, uh, you know, when the plant uptake. So based on you can uh, assess the, the efficacy, you can select the best microbial candidate, which is uh, could be the uh, potential candidate for the future application. So this we published this paper in uh, 2015 that basically deals with three forest species, the acacia, uh, eucalyptus and uh, libesia and three horticultural plants, onion, chili, and strawberry. And 10 species we have observed. Out of all 10 AMRP species, one found one is strain which was found to be the best among all, based on the phosphate, uh, you know, utilizing efficiency in the, in the suits rather than the colonizing ability. Although the colonizing ability may be higher in other strains, but that, that may not be competent in, in, in increasing the plant growth. So that uh, we have obtained and, uh, and other prerequisites could be that we need to have the correct protocols of practicing material control. As you know, many people are working with dead spores. It's very difficult. When you uh, count the spores, some spores may not be healthy, may not be good. And when you inoculate, even may not germinate. So it means that uh, uh, the correct protocol has to be optimized. Uh, most probably count number, NPN method or infectivity potential assay has to be utilized while counting the proposals for using for any program. One more area which I'll be touching a little later that what could be the criteria, how much inoculum has to be applied for cereal crop, because we all know applying for a, in the potted plants, mycorrhiza is easy, showing the growth is easy. But when you go for 1,000 acre of land for say wheat and rice and other crops, then what could be the criteria? So that is also has to be optimized. And how to Dr. apply- I request you to please to now wind up yeah. in Okay, okay. So then uh, we have to apply, uh, how to apply the mycorrhiza, it can be applied for seed treatment and should as a bare root drip treatment in case of rice. And then then how to evaluate the, uh, the response of the plant. One could be that uh, the plant, the microbial dependency, which is highly, highly variable and could be influenced by several factors. Soil fertility could be one and uh, the strain could be one. So therefore it is a the plant, the microbial dependency for, the, for taking the response of the mycorrhiza depends on the plant, the genotypic property of the plant. So therefore, uh, we have to uh, find out the best mycorrhiza as per the plant in combination and, and uh, as far as and the phosphorus. The phosphorus is very much important. When the phosphorus is high, mycorrhiza response will be lower. So it will be negatively correlated. This needs to be optimized. And then uh, we have done a lot of experiments using many plant species, one published in 2012 uh -huh. in a forestry plant, Erythra and Nika, where we have found out how the mycorrhiza can help in the drought stress. Then we assess the phosphate utilization efficiency and phosphate saving in case of onion, 25%. In case of strawberry and also uh, acacia, nilotica, there is a the, the level of the phosphorus has to be optimized. Beyond, beyond the certain level, you see in this slide, uh, the microbial response or dependency is decreasing after beyond 18.25 ppm, 18.25% uh, micro dependency. And you see the phosphorus level uh, here, beyond 20 ppm, there is no response of microbial. So this has to be optimized. Uh, in case of wheat, we also applied the mycorrhiza in two different systems, the flat system and the raised bed system. And mycorrhiza can save up to 25% of phosphatic fertilizers using the raised bed as well as the flat system. And in case of strawberry, micropropagated plants, we also uh, optimize how the mycorrhiza can be can save the phosphatic application. In this slide, I would like to tell you that uh, simply telling 25% saving does not have. So first we have to find out what is the external requirement of mycorrhiza and what is the external requirement of non-mycorrhiza plant. So in this case, we have found the external requirement of mycorrhiza plant was 71 kg, whereas in case of non-mycorrhiza plant, it was 106 kg. So it is almost 35 kg per hectare saving of phosphorus. So in case of the strawberry plant, which is grown under uh, micropropagated condition during hardening phase. After the hardening phase, we use the mycorrhiza, and mycorrhiza can also save the hardening phase time also. And uh, the second aspect, which I'll be uh, uh, you know uh, telling very uh, time is very less. So about the glomerulin, 
how the glomerulin is relevant and so the glomerulin you know uh, it is a blue soil aggregate it sequesters carbon and it is stable for 42 years up to 42 years and a lot of work has been carried out and it can contribute up to 30% of uh, the soil carbon and may account as much as one third of world soil carbon and the one the chinese professor has done lot of work nicolson and uh, right also done and then uh, this is how the uh, aggregation taking place these are the micro and the macro pores and the soil particles and the binding taking place to the hypha and glomerulin most of the glomerulin is stored in the hypha than the spore and this is a study how the carbon sequestration taking place through the glomerulin and then uh, you can uh, and it contribute up to 30% and uh, it can reduce the co2 emission in the environment the organic farming it will not uh, harm, harm the agriculture rather it will promote Uh, the carbon sequester in terms of reducing the co2 emission rather without compromising the profitability and this is how we have conducted the experiment we have targeted the long term experiment trial also and the short term trial also this is the soybean wheat crop rotation is the most predominant and these are the carbon pools we have studied and methodology for the young young students purpose uh, highlighted here and after the glomerulin uh, we have extracted the glomerulin using you see the color difference in the inorganic organic and the mycorrhiza the when inoculated mycorrhiza and organic the color of the extract is darker and this is how you can assess and we have lot of experience working on glomerulin and published one one good paper also recently and you see here the maize and soybean whereas the organic is there the glomerulin stocks and carbon stocks is higher you see the amf and organic and where the maize and soybean as compared to soil soil uh, soil soybean but largely impact of the organic practice is higher as compared to the host so in this case the long term trial we have 15 year long term trial same in this case the organic system uh, is higher glomerulin stocks and carbon stocks and uh, then the glomerulin and co2 this reduces the co2 respiration the glomerulin is higher co2 respiration respiration how uh, uh, we start from can you conclude it yes sir please just one, yeah. one minute please so adoption of crop and soil management practices maintain the higher microbial biomass consistently higher glomerulin production thereby enhancing the stable carbon sequestration glomerulin and mycorrhiza specific signature 36 they have also can be served as a potential indicator uh, to assess the carbon sequestration and the sustainability of crop and soil management practices this we have recently published in new york soil biology long term organic practice and inclusion of maize in the rotation proved to be sustainable and uh, without compromising the crop productivity and these are the biomarkers the liquid biomarkers you see here rather than relying on the microscopic the liquid biomarkers can give a good indication that there is organic practice there the liquid biomass of nf is higher and in both the case whether long term or short term experiment we also carried out the principal component analysis where the most of the biomarkers are stored uh, collected in the maize system under organic uh, and in long term also uh, and in, in the in soybean wheat and the uh, some of the ways how we produce the microorganism fungi the on farm production we have tried we also optimize how to uh, the time for the higher production of microorganism and then recently we have started work on using soybean mill waste and it was results were very increasing here you know soybean mill uh, waste that is hulls with vermi compost produce higher biomass in terms of neutral liquids plfa and spore count so that uh, is also under revision in microorganism so the chunks of spores are being produced these are some of the benefits and meeting the uh, fco requirement although uh, root agriculture is not taking momentum but it is have a great uh, potential and we have to deal with biodiversity convention taking into account to go further in this area and a microscopy method besides this we can also use the liquid biomarker this we optimize at our facility the biomarker facility hydrotherm method and uh, this is how we recently published uh, compare different methods of this some of the success stories of the mycorrhiza uh, uh, application under field condition in different system so third party evaluation is must so under aicrps at different centers the role of mycorrhiza with any bacillus found to be uh, found to be good and bc bc ratio and all they also tried using the field trial experiment it can say up to 25% of the nitrogen in first step fertilizer this is the field trial so this we have also done under mera gaon mera gaur scheme of honorable pm where he has asked all the agriculture scientists to go in the field and adopt a village where you can apply your technology so this was also found to be good under kvk also and then these are take home message from my own talk the studies on root geometry of cultivars should be continued and uh, and we have to select Uh, the best plant species and the best microbiota, and uh, also to evaluate the plant for P response curve is must, and non-linear mutual response has to be tried. 
and breeding varieties and evaluate plant genotype for microorganism dependence should be carried out under low input conditions. Extraction protocol for higher dominant has also to be optimized and the mass production of mycorrhiza and quality assurance uh, through signature liquid and QPCR props has to be uh, continued and third party evaluation at multi location need to be strengthened. Under understanding the relationship of mycorrhiza dominant under different crops under control and environment phase and OTP chamber has to be att attempted. Role of new generation phytohormones such as stragol electrons in mycorrhiza mass production need to be also to be attempted. These are some of the calculations. How to calculate the carbon sequestration in the atmosphere and for the audience purpose, there's a lot of potential of this mycorrhiza and then many multinational companies are you know available in that market. And at the end I acknowledge the community yeah. ARS for hosting me uh, in my postdoc fellowship to work on liquids and DVT and DST for funding mycorrhiza globally in a biomedical project, AMAS project of ICR for funding mycorrhiza to continue. And my earlier uh, mentors, Dr. Alok and Professor Late KGM Mukherjee, who provided me a opportunity to, to start my work career on mycorrhiza, and uh, my director and current director for the permission, my all contributors, my students for their assistance with me. And nevertheless, the MSI executive committee for considering my nomination for MSI fellow and, uh, and uh, organizers of this meeting for me the opportunity. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry that I took a little long. Congratulations to uh, Dr. Mahavir Prasad Sarma for the fellowship. Uh, the, Madam, can I take one more minute? Surely, sir. Uh, this session is empowered by women. Uh, the moderator is uh, Professor Bumruch Kaur and uh, Professor Rupam Kapoor, the president, the efficient uh, president, and uh, Professor J. Savita uh, from Bangalore University, uh, 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 the members I thank her for her generosity of uh, uh, donating our 20,000 for Professor C.V. Subramanian uh, Endowment Award. The Professor Rupam Kapoor efficiently controlled the session and uh, keep uh, on an eye on the time. And the moderator, Professor uh, Munro Chikar, the convener of the uh, uh, this meeting, is ably uh, controlled this whole uh, uh, conference. So the on behalf of the MSI, the MSI has uh, selected uh, Professor Munruchikar for the award of uh, Professor K. Rajan Memorial Award 2021. Hearty congratulations, uh, Madam Professor Munruchikar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for, uh, Dr. Sharma, for an excellent overview on management of mycorrhiza and what characters that should be considered in mind by selecting the most efficient strain to get maximum economic yield. It has been a very interesting session and we had some really eminent high achievers in this session. And 20 minutes, I would agree and I would confess it's not enough for them to summarize their research work, but this is how the conferences we have to you know, really abridge our achievements and work so that we get an overview of what you're doing. And if anybody is interested, can contact them personally for any collaborations. Please accept my congratulations for being inducted in the lead group of fellows of MSI. It is indeed a society which is flourishing and growing under the efficient management of Dr. Raman. And he needs to be largely congratulated and recommended if there could be any award for him also to so efficiently answering all the emails and everything, really commendable. And I would also request my co-chairperson, Professor Savita, if she wants to add to this session. Is not visible here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rupam. Uh, uh, my hearty congratulations to all the MSI fellows. 
like um, who has given uh, excellent presentation and very informative talk and i also thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to co chair the sessions thank you mundrachika good so it is my uh, honor duty to thank my chair and the co chair dr rupam kapoor and dr jay savita for being with us and conducting this session in a very uh, professional manner i thank you both from the core of my heart and over to you avneet dr avneet thank you very much ma'am thank you dr avneet and professor manruchi it is to give us this opportunity to chair the session and it was really a delight listening to all four of them thank you we are also thankful ma'am to both the chair and the co-chair for sparing their valuable time that too for without a break and a long session so we are extremely thankful to the chair co-chair and at the same time we congratulate all the MSI fellow awardees the work speaks for themselves the quality speaks for themselves and uh, that is really an honor for society also to have such efficient such really uh, wonderful mycologists as the fellows so congratulations to all the fellows now we will have a break for lunch and at 150 we all be again together and in that afternoon session post lunch session the very first talk will be from professor evald langer from castle university who also happens to be the editor of basidio mycota section of nova head wikia so we can have 40 minutes of lunch break and at 150 we all be joining again thank you very much one and all chair personal inform inform the chair person and co chair person Sir, they they have been informed, sir. They have been informed. Both are both will join in time. Doctor okay. Gopal is there. Doctor Geeta Sumbli is there. Both will yeah. join in time. They have all the details with themselves. Okay, good, good, good. Yes, sir. That yeah. that much good. that much that much duty is on our part, sir, and we need to do that efficiently. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Doctor Rafiqal. Thank you, ma'am. and uh, dr bernard if i could see the backdrop there yeah. is a picture of the golden temple yeah it's in my office <laughs> yeah it's, it's really pleasant to, to to see that is that is the beauty of this country really glad yes. to see that thank you thank you and uh, heartiest congratulations to dr bernard for this uh, accomplishment of being president of msi really a very good opportunity for msi to have such a dynamic hard working president and dr manruchi as the vice president thank you so sir. we will break here and uh, see you all at 150 sir congratulations